Lovely, thank you. Um, Good afternoon and welcome to the Cornwall Fire and Rescue Service Risk Based Inspection Programme Inquiry. The inquiry is being held virtually via online meetings using Microsoft Teams. I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone for attending today's witness evidence gathering sessions. I'm Councillor Carolyn Rule and I'm the Chairman for the inquiry. I'm joined by my fellow inquiry members, Councillors Martin Alvey, Dominic Fairman, Matt Luke and John Simmons. We are supported today by Justin Sharp from Cornwall Fire and Rescue Service, who is the Area Manager and Head of Community Risk Reduction, and Joe Heather, our Democratic and Governance Officer, who is managing and overseeing the process. The witness evidence gathering sessions are not being held in public, but recordings of each session will be made available on the inquiries area of the Council's website for viewing by the public. Other Cornwall councillors who are not part of the inquiry are able to join the sessions as observers. The objectives from the inquiry terms of reference are as follows. To consider whether the current assessment of risk is an appropriate model for Cornwall Fire and Rescue Service. And two, to consider the future allocation of resource to deliver Cornwall Fire and Rescue Service's overarching protection role, including statutory and non-statutory activities and the primary authority role. Domestic properties and prevention and response activities are not included in the scope of the inquiry's work. The inquiry process consists of a number of recorded witness evidence gathering sessions supported by informal organisational sessions, background briefing information, initial inf informal introduction session and an informal virtual site visit to Parkhouse Flats in St Austell. The recorded witness evidence gathering sessions comprise of us virtually receiving evidence from witnesses who have particular expertise, knowledge and, ex and experience to help us. We value the input of all the witnesses who give up their valuable time to take part in our process and thank them for their input. The witnesses in attendance today are representing Norfolk Fire and Rescue Service, which is a fire and rescue service that is part of a local authority. And we have John Wilby, Group Manager of Protection with us. Welcome, John. Um, and representing Shropshire Fire and Rescue Service, which is a fire and rescue service that is not part of a local authority. We have John Temple, who is the Group Manager of Prevention and Protection. And representing the National Fire Chiefs Council, we have Mark Hardingham, who is the Chairman of the Protection and Business Safety Committee. With regard to the questioning of our witnesses, the process for each will be the same. Each witness will be asked to very briefly introduce themselves and then the inquiry members will ask them a series of questions. Only the inquiry members may ask the witnesses questions. Other members in attendance online who are not part of the inquiry will to observe the proceedings and I will give them the opportunity to comment at the end of each witness session. Although if time becomes tight, this may need to be at the end of the session as a whole. Due to limited time, I will ensure that questions and answers are kept as succinct as possible, particularly as there could be supplementary questions based on responses to other questions. Further written clarification may be sought if necessary, and all questions and responses are to come through me as the chairman. Once witnesses have finished giving evidence, they are more than welcome to stay online for the remainder of the meeting and as, as an observer. The evidence from the sessions will be used to support the inquiry's findings and recommendations, which will be reported back to Neighbourhoods Overview and Scrutiny Committee as the parent committee for approval on the 21st of January 2021 and onward recommendation to Cabinet for consideration on the 10th of February 20, 2021. So thank you for listening to that uh, again and welcome everybody um, and a particular welcome to John. It's lovely to have you with us today and, and uh, thank you very much for spending the time for uh, sparing the time rather to come here and be be with us and we're really looking forward to hear what you have to say. Um, we're going to start off. We've got several of us have questions to ask you if that's OK. Um, the first one is me uh, and that is can you tell us about your role in Norfolk Fire and Rescue Service, please? Yeah, good morning. Sorry, good afternoon. That's a, not a very good start, is it? Um, so, uh, it's John Wilby, uh, Norfolk Fire and Rescue Service. Um, I work within the uh, Protection, Prevention and Emergency Planning Department. Um, my 80% of my role is taken up with uh, fire protection uh, as part of the, the legislative uh, enforcing and regulating body that we are for the regulatory reform order. 
Um, I also have bolt-ons of fire investigation, uh, a little bit of uh, community safety and emergency planning. Um, and I'm also a level three tactical, uh, tactical commander. Um, just a little bit of background. Um, I've been um, in the protection side or the fire safety side since around about um, 2004, 2005, just as we moved from the, the uh, Fire Precautions Act into the regulatory reform order. Um, so I, I've been a, a, a practitioner and um, due to our lack of um, capacity and capability within Norfolk, I still am, even though I'm a group commander, a, a tactical lead, I still have to be a practitioner within um, protection as well. Um, for a long time, I was also the uh, district fire protection manager for the eastern side of Norfolk, which encompassed um, the basically a large, probably about 75% of our coastline um, that took in obviously a lot of the, um, the bed and breakfasts and hotels, and probably a similar profile to um, what you have in, in, your, uh, in your county. Okay, thank you. Hopefully that, that gives you an explanation of, about, about me. Thank you, John. That, that was really interesting. Uh, Dominic, you wanted to ask a supplementary, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, just so we could all be clear. So, uh, John, um, good afternoon. First, um, do you have uh, is, is so do you spend 100 percent of your time on fire uh, protection or do you also have an operation? Uh, do, do you have other roles? You know, your your time. How is your time spent? I wish I could spend 100 percent of my time on protection. Um, un unfortunately, it's not um, because, uh, again, we're a small, small um, uh, service. Um, we have bolt-ons, so obviously I have the I have a level three tactical command side as well. I have the fire investigation side, um, and also the emergency planning side. Um, so I, I guess, in essence, what my role is uh, on the protection side, um, it's about supporting, um, mentoring, and providing direction um, and for our, our fire protection teams out in the districts um, and also giving, as we'll probably talk about earlier, uh, later on, um, uh, guidance um, and advice and um, probably a direction for our, our strategic team on where we should go with protection and certainly reacting to uh, the requirements of the uh, HMI inspections, um, particularly um, which we'll go into later on. So it, in answer to your question, Dominic, no, it's not all protection. Um, however, my desire would be for it to all be protection. But unfortunately, because of the constraints and because of the other requirements within our services, limited amount of um, capacity, we have to take on other roles as well, unfortunately. Does that mean you have to jump on fire engines occasionally? Not quite. So what, what we do, probably very much like Justin and almost the same setup that you have in Cornwall. We have four levels of uh, command, um, incident command, and I'm, I'm a level three commander. But, um, but I also have to dip down into level two as well at times because of, again, lack of, of uh, officers within certain geographical areas. Um, so I, I have I have that role role as well, which is that we all have to put our pens down at times and we have to react. Um, you know, I, I guess in essence, somebody asked me this the other week, and I suppose it's what I actually probably joined the, the role for back in the very, very early 90s. But um, obviously, you know, progressed onwards. And, you know, as you as you move forward, you see the larger picture. And it's not all just about the uh, the, 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 the sort of public facing side of it as such, it's more about uh, protecting the communities, which is obviously what I've gone into. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Martin, please. Martin Alvey. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, welcome, John. Thank you for uh, coming to speak to us this afternoon. I guess following on from what uh, Dominic just said, you don't jump on a fire engine, but you've got a car parked outside with a blue light on it that you do have to jump into from time to time. Yes, that's correct. Yep, yep. That's that's basically that's it, really. Yeah, that's it. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the governance arrangements for your fire authority, please? Yes, sure. So we, we are um, what is termed as a, a county fire and rescue service. Uh, so how our county council is made up, we have an overarching Norfolk County Council. And then within that, we have um, seven district councils, seven, seven local authorities, um, which talking to Justin uh, is um, 
slightly different to yourselves and it can be challenging because obviously we're dealing with seven different groups of for example uh, private sector housing um, so there's that arrangement and then uh, the governance as such is that um, the fire authority is the, the is the cabinet is is the um, is is Norfolk County Council. Um, we come under a group called Community Environmental Services, um, and we have a, a portfolio holder who basically scrutinises um, uh, the work that we do um, and is is our our link into cabinet. Um, and then obviously we do have an overview and scrutiny panel when we go to large, um, like the RMP, for example, obviously when we're doing that, when we when we go through that process, when that has to go out to public consultation, before it does that, obviously goes through the, the uh, overview and scrutiny panel. But in essence, we, we report to a portfolio, portfolio holder within the larger cabinet um, it, itself. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you very much. I'm very similar to Cornwall then, except we don't have the complexity of all the um, um, districts. The districts now, mm -hmm. um, because we're a unitary. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Dominic, please. Thank you. Um, you've somewhat answered this, but there is a, a few things of clarification that would be useful. So the question is, how many members make up your fire authority, and what scrutiny ar scrutiny arrangements are in place? Um, I don't. Yep, I don't know how many members there are. Um, when you say members, you mean elected members? It's well, yeah, so yep. um, in Cornwall, um, all of our elected members, all 123, actually make up the fire authority. Yeah. Uh, but you've touched upon the cabinet and the portfolio holder. So I wondered if yours is slimmer than ours, or is it actually every elected member has some responsibility? No, it, it's um, we, so we have the portfolio holder. Um, the size of the cabinet is around about a, a hundred. There's a, I know there's a hundred elected members. Um, the detail of any further detail, I'm afraid, I, I'm not aware of, Dominic. I'm afraid. That's fine. Okay. No. <laughs> Thanks very much. Okay. The, thank you for that. The next question is from Matt, please, Matt Luke. All right. Uh, uh, afternoon there. Um, John, um, you kind of answered this slightly already, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. Uh, what is the geological uh, size and population of the area you cover? OK, so um, Norfolk is the fifth largest geographic county um, in England. Um, it's got a population of about 900,000 currently at the moment. Uh, it is, it's defined as uh, predominantly rural with certain areas of um, urban. The urban areas are uh, Norwich, the city itself, um, Great Yarmouth and Galston, which is um, one area, a coastal town, and Kings Lynn, um, which is the northwest of the county. Uh, I think the it's about 2,000 square miles, um, all told within the county. Do okay. you want me to just, shall I just actually, it might be worthwhile if I just explain to you quickly is that um, how the service is, is uh, aligned to that geographically. So um, probably similar to Cornwall, we're broken up into districts. We have four districts, uh, the eastern side, which obviously covers, um, if you can picture Norfolk, that goes around the coastline in the North Norfolk area. Uh, then we have the central area, which is predominantly around the Norwich city area and the Broadland area, uh, the southern area of South Norfolk, um, and the, the western side of Norfolk, which uh, takes in the Kings Lynn area. Um, and, and then we have obviously our management pro processes or sorry, management structure within each of those um, districts itself. OK, thank you. Yeah, lovely. Um, thank you for that. Um, I just realized I left my camera on that time. Um, John Simmons is the next question, please. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, John. Um, what is your fire safety structure and service delivery? What are your uh, numbers of the fire safety officers and the fire safety enforcement officers? Are any of them Green Book staff? Yes. Now, do you want me to go into what we are currently 
or what we are proposing to do, which has been born out of the um, largely from the HMI, but obviously from the fallout of uh, um, Grenfell. Well, do, do, would you like me to do both? <laughs> yeah, that'd be nice. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so if I, let me touch on the HMI uh, audit uh, and inspection a couple of years ago, which um, obviously I, I, I know has driven probably yourselves into the position you're in now. And our HMI inspection said that um, basically we need to allocate um, the right weighting of, of resources to maintain an effective um, and efficient risk-based inspection program um, and crucially should include out of hours availability. Um, so let me just touch on that in a moment, just to tell you the, the position we're in with out of hours ourselves, currently as it stands, is that um, we have three grey book level four diploma staff, which level four diploma is basically the, the benchmark standard that you have to be to issue um, formal notices that may be prohibition notices, enforcement notices. And one of those level four diploma Greybook staff is me. And, and the two other Greybook staff are two station managers who are both not on the flexi duty system currently. So you can actually understand why the, the HMI have come in and gone, hmm, that's not particularly effective. What happens on a Saturday night when Mr. Wilby, for example, um, isn't on duty? Um, so you can understand why, why they've um, scrutinized, scrutinized us on that. So currently what we have at the moment is that um, in each district we should, uh, we have a station manager um, and none of those at the moment are level four qualified, albeit that they are going through the process to be level four qualified, um, taking the, the various uh, uh, courses and examinations to get to that standard and they will then be deemed as a, a fire safety manager. Um, so we have those in place at the moment, and their station manager rank, four of those, uh, one in each district. Um, and currently, at the moment, we have seven Green Book staff. Um, no, actually, let me get that quite uh, right. We have, we should have seven Green Book staff. We've actually got 5.3 Green Book staff. Um, we have uh, two in the eastern area, one in the central area, uh, one in the southern area, and one point three of a person because they're about to retire in the in the western area um, they are at the moment those stuff we have got are level four qualified um, and what uh, obviously we're short on we, we are short on numbers at the moment um, so they're managed directly by the station manager um, and obviously they get support from the headquarters, which is the position that I'm in, and also the technical, technical manager, which is a station manager. We also have an additional Greybook member of staff who is in uh, carrying out the project for us on the high rise residential build uh, process that we are having to do. So that's where we are at the moment. Um, and with that, no, no out of hours provision at all, apart from when I'm on duty or we do a recall to duty process. So shall I just move on to what the proposals are, uh, John? Yes, if you want mine, please, yeah. Yeah, sure, okay. Now, just let me just find a particular document I need to refer to. Um, so what, we, what we've done is we've gone about looking to re-engineer and review the whole of the delivery of the protection department within Norfolk. Um, and there's, you know, as you'll probably be aware, for many, many reasons, um, fire protection, not only in Norfolk, but across all of the counties, sorry, all the services, has been eroded over, the, over a number of years for varying political reasons. Um, and, and it's widely recognised that um, a lot of, of the fire rescue services uh, have been underfunded in protections, don't have the capacity and don't have the capability. Um, and, and this was recognised with us. So what we set out to do is that um, the, we, we had to focus on sort of seven key main areas and objectives to get our protection department back to where we believe it will be effective and efficient 
to manage uh, the buildings um, and the, the 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 people within Norfolk itself. So first of all, we, were, we looked at out of hours uh, fire protection, and what we wanted to do is ensure that the service had a structure in place uh, and staff suitably trained to be able to enforce the RRO road to reform order, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, then we needed to look at the suitable resort, or make sure that suitable resources were in place uh, so that uh, we, we were able to carry out the, the RMP objectives and carry out our statutory duties, uh, be able to consult with building regulations and give fire safety uh, advice and react to reported fire safety risks. So make sure that we've got those right resources in the right place. So also then moving on to the third one was making sure we've got an equal balance of FP resources spread across all districts equally to prevent the undue pressure um, on any individual district due to heavy FP workloads. With There's a caveat to that as well, because even though we do have boundaries at the moment, that they are notional boundaries as such. And because of the uh, um, um, uh, capacity of our staff, we have been quite fluid where we've moved staff from one district to another when we've had emergent risks um, and, and, and that's worked well. And, you know, we've got some really, really good staff, as I'm sure Cornwall have, who are really, you know, flexible um, and agile in the, their work um, and then their attitude towards this or the, or the position that we've been in recently. Um, what we also recognised is that we had to develop our staff as well. It was a bit of a glass ceiling, especially for Green Book staff. Um, so what we wanted to do, we wanted to ensure that any additional FP resources provided as a result of the HMI report, they have it, they um, have the procedures and policies are in place to enable them to have appropriate developing development program, and also that they are mentored and shadowed as they go through. Um, we moved on to succession planning uh, to ensure that we've got structures in place allows allows us a means to provide a suitably trained FP staff, green book and grey book at lower grades and roles. And once promoted to a CFP role, they're able to carry out that role competently. So we didn't want to put people in place and promote them before they had the right um, knowledge, skills and understanding to carry out that particular role. So then what we did was that we also looked at um, we needed uh, a specialist fire investigator role along with um, a fire protection role. So we we want a robust cadre of super trained fire, investiga fire investigators uh, that are able to meet the service requirement, taking due cognizance of national developments towards the accreditation of ISO 17020. Well, I'll talk about that more perhaps later on because that is how um, or, or, or their new role as such. Um, and then the costs, they needed to be in line with the RMP proposals um, and what we were, what was proposed um, and what was agreed by Cabinet was that we would have uh, funding of 260,000 for years one and two. And then uh, from year three onwards uh, would be 230,000 to address all the CFP objectives. Um, so that's where we are uh, at the moment. Oh, sorry, that's, that, that's where we are hoping to go. And what the structure is going to look like um, is that we will have um, four station managers within each district who are competent and they, and they will be deemed the fire safety managers who, let me just go back to one part, there's one page I need to look at. Yeah, they will be the competent fire safety managers in each district. Um, and they will manage two Green Book staff in each district um, and they will be termed as now as fire safety inspectors and they will be level four qualified uh, sorry level yeah level four diploma any new staff that we have in will be and so obviously these people may retire move on so any new staff what we decided is that we will have uh, fire safety they, they'll start off as a fire safety advisor and they will work their way through um, they will be on a lower pay grade um, and I, I'm sure you probably have different grades within within the, the uh, your grade green book structure. So they will start off on a scale H, for example, 
And as they progress through the different levels, so the level three certificate, the level three, sorry, level four, the level three certificate, then the level four certificate, and finally to the level four diploma, where they will be classed in as a fire safety inspector, they will go up through the spinal points and also the pay grades as well. So the aspiration of the services, and that will be a requirement, so people won't be able to come in and think, oh, I'd just like to invite being the fire safety advisor. I'm not going to do any more. I don't want to be doing um, building regulations or complex uh, fire safety audits or uh, complex fire safety complaints. I'm going to stick at being this. We said, no, that's not the process. Um, <clears throat> so we will have two of those in each district, a fire safety inspector. Sorry, that's not quite right. We'll have one of those in each district. What I can do is send just in the document so you'll get complete clarity on this. We'll have one fire safety inspector and a senior fire safety inspector um, who will be level five qualified. Um, and they are, will go through the process. Our, our baseline for those to start with will be, um, they'll have to be a level four diploma and they will work their way towards a level five qualification. Um, not only will they carry out the the day-to-day -day audits and complex audits and uh, uh, planning and building reg consultations, but they will also take on specialisms, for example, like fire engineering um, and also potentially enforcement and prosecution. So those are the two, and each, each particular uh, fire safety, um, senior fire safety inspector will have a specialism within the district. So I'll just go back over that again, because I'm afraid I probably got slightly muddled uh, for yourselves. We, in each district, and there are four districts in Norfolk, we will have a level four qualified station manager who's grey book. We will have a senior fire safety inspector who will be level five uh, qualified. And we will have a level four qualified fire safety inspector also in each district. Um, in addition to that, we also have two specialist uh, fire safety inspectors who deal with uh, our licensing activities, our sports ground activities, and also the uh, petroleum activities. So really, that is where we are hoping to go. Uh, we are not hoping to go, we are going. At the moment, we're just going through a consultation process with our staff because um, obviously we have got uh, the people who go into the senior fire safety inspector post will be expected to give out of hours cover. And obviously we've done that through the, the county council's um, out of hours cover uh, overtime process. And that's been consulted on with our staff at the moment. In essence, our staff who we currently have got in place at the moment, there's 5.3 of those. The point three, like I said earlier, is, is about to retire in um, at Christmas. <coughs> in essence, they're actually getting a... Uh, uh, the, the jobs have been regraded, um, job specifications and the descriptions have been audited, re been reviewed, been overviewed uh, by um, uh, human resources and regraded. So they are, they're, they're all happy because they're actually going to get a pay rise because they're going to go jump up one grade. Uh, there's a fire safety inspector is uh, an I grade instead of the fire safety advisor, which they currently are at the moment, is an H grade. So. Uh, at the moment, we're going through that consultation process and the aspiration is that we uh, finish the consultation process uh, beginning of or middle of December. We go out to uh, recruitment um, within uh, the beginning of January. Some of these posts um, are protected for the people already in post um, and they have first rights, for example, to apply for the fire safety, senior fire safety inspector post. Let, does that? I know that there's a lot to it, um, and it, it, this is that's how we where we are at the moment. That's our position as okay. such. Well, thank thank you very much. I think you've answered some of our questions. As well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very I much. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, that sounded really. Uh, I'm trying to make notes on it, but it was there was so much. Is it possible you could let let Justin or or Joe have have that sort of a, a plan of that? Absolutely. That, that sounds sound really interesting, but to, so that we uh, make sure we capture it properly. Absolutely, um, and, that, and, and that's really good. Thank you. Yeah, um, of course. And Dominic, you've indicated you want to ask the question. Just wanted clarity on one point. So, um, 
you touched upon um, a glass ceiling for your green book staff, uh, but you've you've opted, and I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, to make um, your station managers who are grey book your fire safety managers. Did you at any time consider making your green book staff the fire safety managers, um, as in line with your busting your glass ceiling? Um, did we? Well, obviously, obviously, what we wanted to be was inclusive. And actually, that reminds me, Dominic, and thank you. And can I come back to that question? Because something very key that I do need to uh, let you know about is, in addition to the, uh, the post that I've already described, within that uh, uplifting funding, um, we are now going to get, uh, we, we've designed this role, and uh, it's, a, it's a FIPO, which is a Fire Investigation Protection Officer. Um, and there's four posts and there's two grey book and two green book um, and there'll be one in each district and predominantly what their role will be was will be to become uh, a competent level four qualified protection officer and also a competent level five fire investigator um, so in essence uh, we, we perhaps talk about risk-based inspection program later, but there, you know, we we have a huge amount of premises and a lack of capacity to do that or to audit and inspect them. Um, so it's recognised that we needed an uplift in our staff as well. So, but what we're trying to be, do, Dominic, is that we were inclusive of grey book and green book. So obviously, we need a pathway for our grey book staff, uh, particularly uh, to progress through and like the watch manager posts there, the two grey book watch manager posts will enable the people to go into um, the station manager post uh, to be the fire safety managers. I suppose in essence, what are you going back to the question you asked me? Did we consider green book to be uh, the fire safety manager? The fire safety manager is in line with the competency framework. Um, and at the moment, it's decided it's, it's grey. However, I mean, on review, or when we review this as we move forward, uh, there is, you know, potential for that we we could you we could utilise the green the green book to be the fire safety manager. In effect, the the, the senior fire safety uh, inspector will be the manager for the, the fire safety inspector. So they will have a management. Um, part to their role as well. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, can I just take you back? I, I, I don't know whether you said it and I missed it or, or, or whether we didn't pick up on it enough. Um, the um, when in Dominic's question earlier on, where we were asking how many members make up your fire authority, um, he also said what scrutiny arrangements are in place. Did did you answer that one? I can't remember whether you did or not. My love. Yeah, well, we do. We do have an overview and scrutiny panel. Right, that was what that was. And, yeah, so uh, certainly when we have, like, for example, the IRMP, when that's produced, that goes in front of the overview and scrutiny panel yeah. before it goes out to the public. Brilliant. That's the same as we do here then. Thank you. Thank you very much. For that. that was lovely. Um, now, it's my question next, um, and I think you've already touched on this one anyway, really. So um, it, it gives you another opportunity to answer it if you want to say any more. Um, my question is, what is the governance structure within your service? Uh, for example, the protection leadership team? OK, um, the, the protection. So there is um, within the service, uh, we have the assistant chief officer who is responsible for, uh, in essence, protection, prevention and response. Mm -hmm. um, that is then fed down to an area manager, area commander, whichever terminology you choose to, to utilise. Um, and he is the equivalent of, of, of Justin. Um, well, hang on a minute, I'm just to try. The, our area manager, my direct line manager, he has responsibility for protection, prevention and also emergency planning. So then it sits with myself, who has uh, responsibility as the group manager of the tactical lead. Because of, so the area manager is the strategic lead for protection, prevention and response. I'm the tactical lead for protection, prevention and, uh, and emergency planning. And uh, then it feeds down to into the districts. So each district has a station manager, fire protection, 
uh, and then we'll have a senior fire safety inspector and a fire safety inspector, so two staff, Green Book staff, and then also additionally either one extra Grey Book staff who will be a watch manager or an additional Green Book staff which will be the fire investigation protection officer post, FIPO. Now interestingly, um, so you, that's how the structures in the districts work. Um, there is then a, a very strong dotted line back towards myself at headquarters and Mike, who's the technical lead uh, within protection itself back at headquarters. Um, but essentially, even though the, uh, the staff, the fire safety advisors, the Green Book come out of my protection budget, their line management is managed within district. So within that district, the, the CFP station manager then reports straight into his line management is to the district manager, another, a, a group manager. So in, in essence, and that was set up and we have argued the case, um, and it was an argued case, sorry, it was discussed about the best way for a governance within, within the service. Um, but what it does is gives the, the district manager, and again, he or she is in you know, constant contact with me about you know, what the priorities are, setting work streams, setting priorities, managing the risk. But what it, yeah, what it does particularly is, um, and perhaps we'll talk about this later on, it gives the district management team autonomy to respond to specific risks within their district. So obviously we've got the generic risks, but then we have also the specific risk, and that gives them slight more autonomy. So that's the way it's set up as such. Right, thank you, my darling. It's a lot of information you're giving us here. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Martin, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, could you tell me, please, what actually drives your protection activities? OK, so it's really a risk based inspection program, very much like uh, that you will have without a shadow of a doubt within Cornwall as well. Um, so the way that we look at our protection um, and it, it, it's all centred around generic risk and assessed risk. Um, and obviously, the generic, you know, what we're trying to do is that we are trying to um, line up our resources and target our resources to the premises that have you know the highest potential of risk or death or injury um, and there's two particular ca categories um, which is as i've said or a generic and assessed risk so I mean, are you familiar with generic risk and assessed risk uh yeah yes in that we have a, a very similar program by the sounds of it here in cornwall yeah, OK, so we, what we've done is that we've looked at um, all of the generic premises and those particular types of premises are the generic field are the hospitals, the hostels, the care homes, um, the hotels, some other sleeping accommodation. And, you know, we, we know that they are the generic high risk. Um, and what we've done is that through um, our previous inspection program, we've got an assessed risk for all of those buildings now. So out of the 23,000 identified premises that we've got, we've gone through all of the buildings and, and we use CFMS as well as, uh, as our uh, data gathering platform and our management information uh, um, tool. So we've gone through all of the uh, the premises and we weeded out the premises that don't aren't we feel aren't um, uh, well obviously everything is a risk but is a lower much lower risk what we want to focus on is those particular high generic risks the sleeping risks and our IMP base our IRMP has said um, that what we will do is that anything that comes out as a high so from an assessed risk, we will inspect and audit annually. What we are intending to do with all the medium assessed premises that we will inspect and audit those every three years and the low every six years. So we've gone through, each district has gone through um, all of their, those premises um, and 
We've weeded out the ones which are lower risk premises. For example, single domestic dwellings. You know, we've got we don't need to be looking at those. The smaller guest houses, which I'll talk more about later on. Um, other types of premises as well: car showrooms, markets, food courts, shops. You know, we've weeded all of those out, and we're not actually inspecting them as a matter of course. However, obviously the districts will have autonomy to look at those as part of thematic reviews. So over the over a course of six years, we will now and um, we have uh, a program set up and we're just about to start this come April so that we will audit all of our high risk premises and we've got all our high risk premises down or we've got them down to about 17 within the county now. Um, eight of those are um, high, the, the, the actual defined high rise residential buildings, which are there's eight of those in the middle of Norwich, um, which have single staircase. So, for example, they will always be an assessed high risk because they're single staircase, for example. Um, so we will do those annually. And then what we're going to do is every three years, so we'll do the medium um, and we'll do this, and we'll do the low every six years. What that gives us scope for is that each district will then be able to carry out thematic reviews to their particular risks that they have within the districts. And I think I'll come more on to that later on, as long as you've got the opportunity to do so. Thank, thanks, John. And, and with, within that, do you also have a good relationship with, um, for example, the environmental health people within the uh, within districts, um, perhaps the, the social care people? So if, if they're seeing things as well going into people's homes and into businesses, they've got they've got a, a, a mechanism and a relationship with yourselves to feedback if they, they spot particular concerns. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, mean, I was going to touch on that and on the, some of the, you know, when the, you know, the three or four recommendations I was going to give you. But without a shadow of a doubt, you know, there's potential for and there is um, we've got strong links within each district. And obviously we work slightly differently to Cornwall because we have to deal with seven local authority private sector housing. Um, but yes, so there's a referral pathway. There's the service level agreements and memorandum of understandings between each of those districts. So we've got a pathway referral pathways um, and what to do out of ours. That's fantastic, John. Thanks. I'd, I'd better shut up now because I appreciate time is marching on. Thank you, Martin. Um, thanks, Jonathan. That's lovely. The next question is from Dominic, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. So mine is just the confirmation of a couple of statistics. Uh, how many premises do you regulate under the Fire Safety Order of 2005? And how many of these premises are on your risk-based inspection programme, please? Uh, okay, well, there's about 23,000. Um, last year, we managed to audit uh, 815 of those premises. Um, whatever, I don't work the percentage of that out. Um, so as part of, and I don't know, so obviously we've gone through that process and I don't have the figures to hand. So the premises that we are going to audit as 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 path the course, shall we say, and those premises that are not going to be thematic reviewed. I don't have the figures, but what I can do is that it won't be too easy to I'll talk to our fire intelligence unit. Um, so I can I can give those figures to pass them on to Justin at a later date for yourselves. Sorry, I can't give you specific no, figures, Dominic. That's but in writing will be absolutely fine. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from John, please. Uh, or do you mean Matt, Chair? No, it says John on my one. Oh, am I looking at the wrong sheet, am I? don't know. Definitely Matt on mine as oh, well. Wait, I'll, I'll go. Um, OK, you go first then. <laughs> mm. um, yeah, uh, can, you can you define your risk-based inspection programme and tell us what factors are taken into account? Do you use an existing model? I think you've slightly covered that already, but carry on. Yes, uh, yes. The, well, the model is basically how I've described it. Um, it is to look at the, the, you know, the assessed, the assessed risks, um, and also tie that in particularly with the generic high risk as well. Um, that is our model. Um, that's what we've stated. So what we're doing really, Matt, is we're, we're working to what was set out in the IRMP, um, and it is a, a roundabout that you know. 
I suppose the generic risk, the generic high risk, which essentially um, is defined as where you're likely to have five or more fatalities occurring in one instant or where that type of building is. And so, as we all know, it's the sleeping risk. And so I'm you know, obviously speaking to Justin, in fact, all the services are like that. Obviously, that's where, you know, with the resources we've got currently got, that's where we've been focusing our attention on over the last uh, five or six years. And in reality, what it has been is inspecting and auditing of care homes, hotels, um, and also um, uh, other sleeping risks as such. But it's now say it's centered on um, all the data that we've gathered, um, mixed in with, uh, or uh, in combination with the generic risk as well. So the high, medium and lows of the generic risk will be audited over that six year period. Yeah, well, similar to us then, you know, Great Yarmouth would be like, you know, the majority of Cornwall with uh, the holiday trade and so forth. Yeah, okay. absolutely. The whole of the North Norfolk coast, I think, is probably it replicates uh, the Cornish coast as well as in for the risks. Uh, you know, and, and I've got something to talk about on the uh, sort of so, uh, small uh, B and B's stroke guest houses later. Okay. okay, thank you. Lovely. Uh, the next question on my list is from me. Um, can you tell us the number of inspections that you undertake and whether they are all classed as high risk? Also, how many enforcement notices, prohibition notices and prosecutions have taken place during 2019 stroke 20? Um, all of that information um, oh, it sounds, I know, it sounds like a, a freedom of information request. I don't have that to hand, I'm afraid, okay, but what I can do again um, is so you would like to know all of our formal notices that we've served, uh, which is prohibition notice. Yeah. And within what period? of t What was the year? Just that year, 2019 to 2020. OK, the last be... financial year. So yeah. all the formal notices. Um, I can give that to you. I can pass it on to Justin. Brilliant. Thank um, you. If you just bear with me while I make a note of that. It's just for comparison, really, you know, that would be yeah. helpful. Thank you. Formal notices served. And the audits that we did was the one that I spoke to Matt about a moment yeah. ago, and that is the 815 audits. Yeah, audits. 815 audits. And that has been, um, I'd say that's been an average probably over the last uh, 10 years or so. Yeah. And were they all classed off your high risk register, those those 815? Yeah, so so it states in our uh, protection and uh, functional plan that we will audit all the high risk premises. And just as a matter of interest, we had did have it probably about five years ago in the region of 80, 80 right. uh, high risk premises. Um, and through uh, engagement, uh, we've managed to bring that um, that quantity down to about 17 but oh, some, well some of those are, yes. they're never ever going to change like oh. the example i gave to you earlier on with the, the high-rise buildings um you know with single staircases be mm -hmm. because of the risk that obviously you're aware of grenfell for example yeah you know, um we, we cannot change that mm -hmm. thank you darling um the next question is from martin please no i'm a bit confused carolyn because Am I asking what are your enforcement procedures? Yes. You, yeah. uh, it's just that our, our, our names and questions seem to be different to yours now. Oh, sorry, darling. That's, uh, that's, I'm just reading off my list. Yeah, it's about the enforcement one. Can you ask so that question? What are your enforcement procedures to the point of signing off an enforcement notice? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so what we do is that... Um, when the premises is identified either through an alleged fire risk, a fire um, or through our audit and inspection program, we um, the premises identified, the audit is taking place. Uh, we then have a case conference and that case conference was generally going to be or it should be between a level four qualified person. And as I've alluded to earlier on, that's slightly problematic at the, po at the moment. Um, or between two level four competent people. So it's almost like a check and balance. Um, so that will then get taken forward. So for example, if we're serving an article 31 notice, a prohibition notice, um, that will then get taken forward 
to uh, a principal officer, uh, part of the strategic management team. Um, again, a little bit of scrutiny uh, and oversight. Questions will be asked to make sure that we've got our ducks in a row, for example, um, and we're compliant with, with the legal process. Um, and then that's, that is signed um, and the letter. So it's, got, it's basically it's signed by a principal officer. So you've got those checks and balances as you go through. Um, and um, the, then the formal notice, uh, the process is gone through and then, and then it's served. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, Martin. Um, the next question is is number 12. I have it down for Dominic. It's about IT. Yeah, thank you, that's fine. Um, so do you have any challenges with IT that are a barrier to delivering risk-based inspections? And if so, how have you addressed such issues? Um, good question. The what we've used there well, previously, we used something called Terium for a service uh, for our management information program, and we went on to see from this probably uh, 15 years ago, and then we've been upgraded to see from this live. So, obviously, as a practitioner myself, I mean, I've used it considerably, and obviously, I do quite a lot of searches on it um, and using the various uh, FSET codes, sub lines. I find it good. I, th I find it's fit for purpose. Um, we're able to run our reports. Um, the fire intelligence unit who uh, deal with all of the data, they're able to do all of the returns quite effectively and efficiently to HMI and to home office when it's required. Um, we have had some issues around uh, some of the standard letters and paragraphs. Um, but generally, I think CFMS, which is I know what you use as well, I, I understand, you know, I, I think it's uh, it, it's effective, it's efficient, it's, it does, it, it's fit for purpose. Um, it can be expanded on further, I understand, which we're probably trying to do now. For example, um, there's something called a DORF code within the uh, facility within the programs. So for, for, we can put in for, put in further information for uh, some of the uh, guest houses, for example. So how many bedrooms they actually have, how many floors they have. So I know that we can utilize it further, but as a management tool, I think it's pretty good. And um, I haven't said that. I understand obviously there's potentially other, you know, good management tools out there, but it, it suits our needs and our purpose. And um, just specifically, when you're trying to share information with your um, county council or districts, um, do you have any issues with trying to identify premises or do their systems work well with yours or are there any issues there? Uh, so we, I, funny enough, I spoke to Justin about that because we've got we've got a, a slight issue in Norfolk at the moment of um, we're trying to discover what we don't know right. because um, we, we like I said, we've got a, 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 we've got 23,000 premises listed on CFMIS, but we think there's more than that. I was talking to Justin earlier about that uh, or early in the week. And there are, you know, how we find that out, I don't know. Um, obviously, there's potential through OS and through through our, um, through um, the rates department as such within county. Um, when it comes to sharing information, apart from obviously the GDPR issues, um, the, the information flow is, is pretty good. Um, like I said, we've got SLAs, Service Level Agreements and uh, MOUs, Memorandum of Understandings between the key uh, regulators and enforcers within the, the county council and within also the district councils. So certainly when it comes to the public safety, um, you know, fire safety, I, I'm, I'm quite confident that um, we can react either individually um, in, as an individual uh, regulatory body or uh, as a combination of, of both or maybe sometimes even three. Thank you. Okay, so Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of the time and I know that John Temple has joined us. So, John, I'm sorry we are overrunning slightly. Um, I hope that you're OK just to, to hang on for a minute while we finish the questions. Um, <laughs> my apologies for that. Um, the next no, that's question... absolutely fine. Thank you, darling. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, the next question I have is Matt. Uh, question 13. Uh, right, OK. Uh, I think you've answered this already, but you can expand on it slightly. Can you tell us how you undertake your statutory duties and any other partnership working arrangements, which I think you've already covered, but 
anything else you want to add? Yeah, the, the partnership working arrangements, we don't have, unfortunately, um, the um, ability to carry out um, the um, prop. And, you know, I've actually forgotten the name of it, which is quite embarrassing. Where will you take on responsibility, for example, a group of, um, uh, or, uh, for example, if it's got a national uh, group of premises, the, and that has just escaped my memory, we don't have the ability to take that on as such, because again, it's down to capacity and, and uh, of our the staff that we have um i think from was, was the other part of the question was which was uh, what sorry matt sorry I'll, I'll, I'll read it out again uh, can you tell us how you undertake your statutory duties and any partnership working arrangements so i think it's a yeah the part, partnership working arrangements which i'm asking about because the other bit you've already covered yeah the partnership working arrangements um which was the primary authority scheme. I knew it came to me eventually, so I do apologise. It's slightly embarrassing. I forgot about it. The primary authority scheme, we don't have uh, the capacity to carry that out, albeit it would be an aspiration of ours in the future. Um, but again, it's down to the capacity. Um, but, you know, ha again, the, the statutory duties, um, we have that. In, well, I've, I've just based, I have gone through how we actually manage that. And how we yeah. um, how we uh, uh, give capacity and capability to manage those statutory duties. Yeah, I think you've already covered it anyway, so that, that's fine. I'm happy with that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Sorry, just we just let the fire uh, go whizzing up past my place, and that was the siren you heard. Um, yeah, that, I think you've answered. The, the, there was no, question number thirteen was missed out there, which was about the primary authority scheme. But you've answered that anyway in right. your answer to Matt, so that's great. Um, so now we're coming on to the last two. You'll be glad to hear um, that you've had prior knowledge of. So the first one is from me. How do the objectives in the inquiry's terms of reference affect your respective organisation? Well, I think I've answered that overall. When I when I when I spoke about the what we in, our intentions are, and and how how we have managed um, our capacity or lack of capacity, and we recognised that we recognised it before. Um, obviously, the HMI appeared, and before you know, we we were all aware of the lack of capacity and potential capability within um, the fire and rescue service. Uh, but I, I, I think, you know, it, it, it's it's important that we, we recognise that we have the generic risks, we have the um, assessed risks, and we have identified those and we, we are able to um, have the staff who are capable, agile, the capacity to audit and inspect those premises and make sure that, um, you know, again, we keep uh, our, the public and the guests and visitors to our county safe, basically. Okay, thank you, darling. Um, right, and then the final question, um, I wonder if I can ask John to ask, ask this one, please. That's question 16. Oh, yeah, thank you, yeah. Um, if you could put forward three or four recommendations to the inquiry that would support your organization, what would they be? And importantly, why? Yeah, OK. Um, I think that um, anything that we do, um, always think about the reputational value and credibility of the fire rescue service uh, and also the council. And I think, well, we've always, you know, we've got to consider the consequences of of, of any potential outcomes or proposals. Um, and I think, you know, we need to look at the advice I'll give is, you know, potentially look at smarter ways of working, um, utilising and working clearly uh, and in tandem with other enforcing and, and regulatory authorities, such as trading standards and also your private uh, sector housing, which I think you do already. But, you know, service level agreements and memorandum of understandings um, you know, they are key to effective and efficient and joined up working as well. 
Um, what I'd also say is uh, potentially I advise you to look at residential social landlords, um, housing associations, they've increased, got an increased portfolio of housing stock, the demographic of the residents lends itself to an increase in the risks. So again, uh, join up with um, their dedicated fire safety managers and also private sector housing as well to enforce the housing uh, act where that's required and potentially join up not only with your protection team, with your with your um, uh, home safety teams as well, because that will all dovetail in um, with, with making those type of that profile of residents safer. Um, I think it's important you've got to recognise, uh, you know, your 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 life risk is your priority, uh, and it's imperative that you consider the buildings um, that are integral to your economy as well. Um, you know, we, we are, after all, you know, we, we're key stakeholders in our county's economic and the social development. Um, but, you know, what I've described is that with our new risk-based inspection programme and the way that we've aligned it to uh, the generic risks and the assessed risks is that um, it will give us capacity to focus some of our resources on thematic and specific premises. So, you know, for example, again, talking about the economy within within your county um, and also within ours as well, you know, it's, it's key. It's not, it's not just the life risk that's important. It is, you know, the, the buildings that, that help us or help our counties thrive. So, for example, you know, heritage buildings, uh, members of where the members of the public enter, uh, large industrial premises with lots of staff, and particularly within our western part of the county food processing for example you know we want to make sure that those buildings are particularly safe you know we don't want to lose them because they're key within our economy and how our counties work you know, and you know we've come under a huge amount of scrutiny if we were to lose a large heritage building uh, again again for all the obvious reasons but also it's a key factor within our economy brings people in and also the large industrial premises uh, again, you know, huge amounts of jobs. You know, so I'm, you know, particularly it's a passion of mine that we look at the economy as well as the life risk, um, and also particularly at the moment as well. You know, we, we've got the issue with the pandemic. You know, so we've got potential issues with schools. So what, you know, what I've recommended to and what we're doing is now is we're engaging with our schools. Um, you know, we're trying to give them protection advice because they've been left out for some considerable time. We haven't audited and inspected apart from the boarding schools. We haven't engaged with them. And we know, for example, they're propping the doors open um, in a means of escape because they want to try and obviously lessen the touch points. They want to um, be able to give, get the ventilation in, but it's not appropriate they do that. So we're finding that we're doing a lot of work with them at the moment. And then, you know, we've, we've got guest houses as well, uh, particularly around our coastline ones which uh, you know we want to find out which ones are the greatest risks but we can't in inspect and order all of the, the the guest houses with which which you just have one room for example um so we had to go back and we've got we had to make come up with a definition of what will be audited um the larger the higher risk guest houses so basically what we've said is that um we're, we've gone back to the old fire protect fire prevention act 1971 and our definition is going to be that um, if it has more than six persons um, or has more than two floors, we're going to audit and inspect again because it's a higher risk. Um, also, you know, halls of residence and student accommodation, uh, purpose built. We, we, we've got to learn from such as the incidents elsewhere in the country, such as the Cube Fire in Manchester. Uh, again, a high risk. So potentially focus your risk based inspection program. Um, on particularly on, on student accommodation. Um, we're actually going at the moment, we're looking at all high rise residential buildings over 18 metres and we're going to carry on doing them, those annually and it's part of the inspection program that we've got to do for MHCLG. Um, but again, what about the residential builds that fall, that fall between 11 metres and 18 metres? Because I guarantee that in Cornwall you've got plenty of those. Those buildings that are, you know, four, five and six floors uh, you know, you need to be engaged with private sector housing as well, um, and also, you know, you potentially your your uh, department that is home safety um, and community safety team, because there's a lot of work we can do to make those premises safer. Um, again, they have escaped 
and they haven't been audited or inspected under the Housing Act by the local authority or by the regulatory or, or by the fire safety uh, teams because we just haven't had the capacity. But to risk, they need to be looked at. So I'd recommend you look at those. And lastly, you know, make sure that you allow your district managers uh, to have the autonomy and give them the capacity to react to any emergent risks um, that are specifically identified risks within their districts, as I've described. And that is key. And obviously, as you work through, and I'm sure you will do, because I know you're probably going to end up some, having some changes, make sure that you engage with all of your staff because they're key and they will help you drive and shape the way that the protection department is and ultimately make it safer for the residents and visitors of Cornwall. OK, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, my love. That's really interesting and loads of information you've given us there, uh, which is great. Um, there are some things that we wanted extra clarification on, then, though. So um, I wonder if I can ask Joe to to just drop you a line and email to let you know. Yeah. So, so that we can make sure we find the bits and pieces that we wanted a little bit more clarification on. Um, that would be really helpful. And, so, and John, it, thank it, you so much for your time. It's been really good to have you with us. Um, if you want to stay, that's fine. Um, you, I know yeah. how busy you are. If you need to go, that's also fine. But thank you so much for your time. It's been really interesting to meet you. Um, we're supposed to be having a break, but as we've overrun, I would like to suggest that we keep going. Is everybody yeah. happy with that? Yeah. yeah. Um, before we start, because of the confusion with the questions last time, I was working from the list that I'd been providing provided with. Can I just run down through the questions uh, who I've got them to be but be from to make sure that we're OK? So um, the question one is Martin, two is Dominic, three is Matt, four is John, five is myself, six Martin, seven Dominic and eight Matt. And then uh, nine is myself, ten is Martin, eleven is Dominic. 12 is Matt and 13 is John. Is that the same no. list as you've all got? No, no. It's, it's the no. same up to question eight. And then you oh, that's where it went wrong last time. Right, yeah. so, after, so question nine, who should question nine be? Mine. John. John. Yeah. Right, and what about 10? Yours. Who? You. Caroline. Caroline, right, right, me, yeah. And 11? Me, Martin. Martin. And 12? Dominic. Dominic. And then 13. Matt. Matt. Yeah. Right. Thanks very much. It saves it being so embarrassing then. Thank you very much, my darlings. I'm sorry to be. I was working for the list I had, so I don't know quite know what's gone wrong there. Right. Um, so can I welcome John Temple? It's lovely to have you here with us. Um, sorry, we're running a little bit late now, but uh, hopefully that's OK. But it's good to have you here with us. I'm th I know how busy you are, so we are very grateful for your time. Justin, did you want to say something before we start? No, not at all, Chair. I just wanted okay. to be visual for John so that he knows that I'm I'm here as well. Lovely, John. Right. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Justin. <laughs> Thank you, John. So um, welcome to this afternoon's event. We've, we've got several questions we'd like to ask you. Um, starting off with the first one is from Martin, please. Thank you, Chair, and uh, good afternoon, John. And surplus of Johns without a H today, and I'm a John without a H in my middle name as well, so uh, you're in good company. Um, Excellent. So my, my first question um, really is a bit of an intro one. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your role in the Shropshire Fire Rescue Service, please? Yes, yeah, certainly. Firstly, um, um, hello all and uh, thank you for inviting me to the uh, to the scrutiny panel. Um, so, yes, John Temple, um, prior to the fire service, I spent 10 years in the military as a as a diver in the uh, Royal Engineers um, and then left that and decided it was time to do um, some proper work. And uh, so I ended up in the f fire service um, that was 23 years ago. Um, I joined Staffordshire Fire and Rescue Service as a firefighter, spent six years there. Uh, and then felt it was time for a change and moved to Shropshire, which is my home county. Um, I worked my way through the ranks as a crew manager and as a watch manager on watches, so operationally. Um, and then I went into the training department for three and a half years where I specialised in all training areas because we're a relatively um, small fire service. Um, so we have to specialise in all areas. Um, and then back in 2013, I was promoted station manager where I worked in a number of different departments. My first one was operational risk. 
So that was looking at uh, risk information to firefighters. So as they go out to incidents, they have the right risk information for them. Um, and also working with other partners, uh, supporting them with regards to risk, such as safety advisory groups. Um, as I'm sure you guys know more, more than more than most through a council that uh, what a safety advisory group does. Um, and then I also worked on a number of other stations where I was responsible for stations and on call um, stations. Um, basically responsible for service delivery. And then in 2017, um, I was temporarily promoted to group manager, uh, which is the rank that I am now. And I was responsible for all our on-call services, so approximately 350 to 400 on-call staff. Um, and then just over a year ago, I was made permanent in position. And uh, the role that I took on then was the um, manager for prevention and protection, which is where I am now. So it's probably worth noting at this stage that um, my my protection experience, if you like, through fire safety um, is relatively limited potentially to some of the people that you probably or my predecessors that you've spoken to. Um, that was a concern of mine initially because I don't come from a protection background, so I don't have that technical knowledge or understanding. Um, but because my role was more of a tactical and strategic decision making level, um, anything of a technical nature, I would use, I would ask my team for that information. So what I have done is, is, is speak to them at great length to try and prepare myself for this meeting so I don't completely embarrass myself. Um, so I have made some notes, so I'll make some apologies if I do end up actually looking at my notes. But conversely, they might actually be beneficial because I can perhaps send them on to you later on if there's any sort of additional questions that you want to ask that um, helpful yes yeah so that's that's kind of where i am really so ultimately within the department i manage the strategic and tactical decisions for prevention and protection um and our, our primary focus at the moment is the recommendations coming out from the grenfell tower inquiry and the impacts of that and the change in legis legislation and also ensuring that we prepare ourselves for the next visit of the HMI CFRS. Um, so we did have a number of recommendations from that, but as a service, we came out as good, but obviously as all services, we're striving for the, for the excellent. Um, but within protection, there were a number of areas for um, improvement or recommendations, if, I, if you like, um, very similar to a lot of other services, such as um, um, a lot of services were seen to be under-resourced in that area, um, which in my 12 months experience of being in here, I can concur is definitely the case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Martin. Um, the next question is from Dominic, please. Good afternoon. Um, so can you tell us about the governance arrangements for your fire authority, please? Hi, uh, Dominic. Yes, uh, our, our governance really then. So we are a um, combined fire authority. Um, so we're made up of two local authorities, um, and that is Telford, Telford and Reakin and Shropshire. So just to give you a very quick overview of the county, we've got approximately half a million people in Shropshire as a whole. Um, and within that, in the, the Shropshire County Council, we've got approximately 310,000 people. And in Telford and Reakin, we have 180,000. Our fire authority is made up of 15 people, 15 members um, with three statutory members, which is basically the chief fire officer, um, the chair and a, um, I think it's like a scrutiny um, uh, member, if you like. So, um, yeah, so, so ultimately um, they, they have overall responsibility for our service. Um, and generally speaking, what we have is we have a strategic advisory group, uh, which is known as the STAG, uh, which is made up of senior officers and one or two fire authority members. And they would also then feed back into the main bulk of the fire authority. Um, but prior to that, um, we have as, as a service, um, our IRMP, our Integrated Risk Management Plan, uh, which is put together uh, through a team um, every, every five years. And um, through that, that generally builds um, a, our service plan and which then feeds into our uh, departmental plans, etc. Um, and then that that uh, delivers the work that we've got to uh, we've got to do for that year on year over that five year period. And then that is scrutinized um, 
on a monthly basis by our SMT, which is senior management team, which is generally made up of senior, well, it is senior managers within the service, but not the fire authority. Um, the fire authority tend to meet on a quarterly basis um, and then SMT and designated speakers will then feed back to our fire authority to ensure that we're hitting the targets that we said uh, we could actually meet. They do also, sorry, Sorry, yeah. Dominic. They do also have access to what we call a dashboard. So for facts and figures, um, and the fire authority members would have access to log into those so they can see if they wanted to on a daily basis quite how, how we're doing. No, that's brilliant. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Matt, please. Uh, yes. How is your fire authority made up and what scrutiny arrangements are in place? Um, thank you, Matt. Um, I suppose I've answered some of that in my, yeah, in my previous say, question. Yeah, done some of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, to, to prevent sort of um, repeating myself, um, uh, I'm just trying to think. So so what was the second part to that question? Sorry. Um, oh, what's more importantly, uh, what scrutiny arrangements are in place? So this, again, I, I have covered that really. So the scrutiny really is our... Um, the strategic, uh, let me just have a look at it again, the uh, strategic advisory group um, that sits on a, um, a quarterly basis will look at our, um, our figures uh, on our dashboard to see how we're performing against what we'd set initially in our service plan and our departmental plans that were ultimately agreed by the fire authority. Um, so depending on how those graphs are inclining or declining, um, individual departmental heads would give a report uh, monthly on why those figures are either going up or down um, and would also sit in on the strategic advisory group should our fire authority members uh, wish to ask any questions um, on those reports. Does that, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Uh, the next question is from John, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, afternoon, John. I feel, afternoon. The, I feel the old one out because my uh, John's got an H in it. It's, um, <laughs> it's very similar to King John's. Anyway, uh, I think you've answered my question. It's uh, what is the geographical size and the population of the area which you cover? But I think you've already answered that question. Yeah, so uh, probably just to put a expand on it a little bit more is that um, Shropshire um, is the largest landlocked um, county in England. Um, so we, we, rurally, we're very large. Um, and like I said, there's, there's half a million people that live here and the vast majority live in the two towns of Telford and Shrewsbury. And the rest of it is uh, smaller market towns and obviously villages and hamlets. So we're, we're very rural, probably not too dissimilar to Cornwall in the, in the top, topographical sort of layout. Mm -hmm. OK. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. The next one is from me. Um, what is your fire safety structure and service delivery? And what are your numbers of fire safety officers and fire safety enforcement officers? And are any of them Green Book staff, please? OK, uh, lots of questions. So if I forget any, I'll, um, I'll try I'll and come back. Um, it's right. <laughs> come back. Thank you. Um, so our department, um, I have, um, there's 13 in our team. Um, so I'm responsible for a station manager who is solely responsible for a team of 12 that sit under underneath him. Um, and that 12 is made up of uh, and they're all to a level four, um, far, uh, level four diploma level in fire safety. Um, that that's that's the ultimate. Some are a little bit more, some are level five. Um, so we're asking our watch managers, if you like, to go to level five. Um, but we would expect a minimum of level four for all of them. So we have five watch managers and um, they're all watch manager Bs. I don't know if that makes much difference to you guys, but they, there's a difference between A and B uh, within the, the pay scales, if you like. So they're all a watch manager B and they also provide our out of hours cover. So I don't know whether you want to cut, touch on that later on, but part one of our recommendations from the HMI was to ensure that we provide a out of hours uh, fire safety cover. Uh, we have done that in a number of different ways in the past. We've used 
flexi duty officers, which generally a station manager and above, to fulfil that role. However, the vast majority of us and them um, were not trained to the right level. So they would have a, sm a very small two, three day bespoke course. Um, and generally that skill fade came quite quickly. So we realised that the best people to give us that advice out of ours would be the inspecting officers that are doing it day in, day out and are trained to a high level. Um, so there was an agreement with them uh, and through the representative bodies that they would do that with an 8% um, uplift on their pay. So there would be five of them working a rotor system. Um, so basically they work for a week, sorry, they're on call for a week and then they're off call for four weeks and they would pick up um, anyone's leave, sickness, et cetera, et cetera. So, and they got an extra 8% on their wage for that. Uh, and then sat beneath those, you'd we had three crew managers and um, the three crew managers, generally speaking, um, deal mainly just with audits. It's also worth mentioning, actually, out of the five watch managers, they tend to be involved in projects more than actually auditing. So we might have ongoing prosecutions. We might have large uh, businesses that are struggling, so we would offer them support um, through that. So they would end up doing actually less audits. Your three crew managers, generally they would have less responsibility um, with the larger projects and complex buildings, so they would continue to do more auditing. Uh, and then we would also, we've also got four Green Book staff, and uh, they're all level four. Well, actually, one of them is now, two of them actually, I tell a lie, are level five uh, fire safety inspecting officers, um, which actually wasn't part of their role map um, or part of their pay scale. However, um, we offered them that extra development from level four to level five for their own um, continued professional development. Um, and they took it. And to be fair to them, um, have done a, done a good job, um, but it's not part and part of their pay scale. But that's something we're looking at as a service to to look at um, to ensure that their pay scale matches their skills and their qualifications. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it's just worth mentioning to you guys at this moment. There, there is a real concern, certainly within our service and possibly other fire services, that because of the change in leg legislation from the Grenfell Tower inquiry, there are um, um, approved inspectors that are out there working in the private sector, and um, a lot of them probably not trained to the level we would hope or we would wish for. Um, and there was a big cry out for well-trained um, fire safety inspecting officers. So we worry as a service that potentially the, the pay that we give our green, green book staff um, generally isn't as high as our grey book staff um, because they don't give the operational commitment, but a fully trained grey book um, person would be on about £28,000 a year and um, they could potentially earn a lot more than that outside in the private sector. So again, as a service, we make sure that um, our terms and conditions and our working environment is, is, is so good that they don't want to leave us, is the reality. Um, so that, that's our break up there, that although we have 12 people, probably at any one time, six of those are actually out auditing um, for one reason or another. Right. The only, are any of those officers Green Book? Sorry, yes, the inspector. Yes, we have four Green Book inspecting officers. Lovely. Right, thank you, um, John. That was that was a really complicated um, response there and a complicated question in the first place, which prompted it. Is it possible you could um, let us have that in writing, just to send it through to Justin or to Joe for us so that we've actually got it in our hands to, to see it and compare it? Would that be OK? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. That would be really helpful, I think, my darling. I tried to write down what you were saying, but I think it'd be easier to have it <laughs> written down for me. That would be helpful. OK. Uh, Thank you, my love. Uh, the next question is coming from Martin, please. Thank you, Chair. And uh, again, you touched on uh, um, some of this already, um, but what is the actual governance structure within your service, um, in particular um, within the protection leadership team? Uh, so the governance within the protection team itself. Um, so we have the inspecting officers, which are Green Book, and grey book and the grey book crew managers and watch managers and then overall governance of that 
well, ultimate responsibility for that team is the station manager who is a flexi duty station manager so also have additional responsibilities that come with that role the operational side of it um, but generally that um, station manager will be trained to a minimum level of level four diploma um, so has a good understanding of how the team work but that individual won't be going out doing audits they wouldn't have the capacity to carry out any audits themselves but they would act as a quality assurance process um, to ensure the staff are um, working to the right standard and um, ultimately that that station manager also ensures that they're carrying out the right amount of audits per year um, and then he would then feed back to me and I would as the uh, the, as the group manager responsible for prevention and protection and then I feed back to our senior management team on a monthly basis and then that senior management team would then answer back to the fire authority or our strategic advisory group um, on a quarterly basis. Does that, does that answer your question Martin? That's brilliant it does thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much Martin and, and John. Uh, next question is from Dominic please. Yeah, so a nice open question uh, what drives your protection activities? Um, OK, so like it's quite a big question, really, as in <clears throat> um, our risk based inspection program really is what drives our, our audits. Um, and someone asked me what a very simple question is define risk to me. And um, it, 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 it was it just turned out to be so complicated to actually define what our risk is. Now, um, ultimately, we have through the IRMP, our Integrated Risk Management Plan that's done every five years, we look at our current and potential future risks within the service. And also it, um, our historical risks also will impact the IRMP. Um, and then, so that kind of gives us the type of risk that we have within our service. But under the regulatory reform order, which is really how uh, what uh, governs our, our our work and how we work and what we the, the, the statutory requirements that we must fulfill. Um, so we must um, audit business premises um, within our um, within our community. And um, the way that we do that is we need to find out how many businesses we've got um, and then we need to prioritize those um, businesses. And to do that, we use we have what we call a risk based inspection program an RBIP. And um, that's made up of a number of different um, um, inputs, if you like. So we use a software system called CFMIS, and I, I did hear John just touching on earlier. And I, I am fully aware that a number of other fire services do use CFMIS, probably the vast majority, actually, um, because it's a very good system. Um, so within that database, we have currently in Shropshire, we have 19, sorry, 18,000. Uh, premises on that list. Um, but that said, just to be sure, again, I heard John touching on it. It's it's the known unknowns and you'll hear about protection departments talking about the known unknowns and we've all got them. All services know that there are premises out there that we're not aware of. So to assure ourselves that we've got a grip and we understand of all those premises that and I, and I mean uh, commercial premises out there. Um, we look at other ways of gathering that information. Now, at the moment, our services is looking to build a gazetteer um, that has a lot, all the premises in there using UPRN, your unique property reference numbers. But that's ongoing work with us at the moment, and um, it's taking longer to build than we first thought. Um, so that's there and working in the background. But ultimately, we're looking at um, companies that are out there, and one of the companies we're looking at closely at the moment is a company called Experian Limited uh, and they gather national data and um, they can bring up all sorts of formulas to give you all the information that you want with regards to risks and type of risks and so they've given us a, um, a snapshot of what our service should have and ultimately um, Shropshire has just shy of 30,000 commercial premises. So we know we're almost 10, well, we are 10,000 short uh, in our um, CFMIS database, if you like. Um, but we, we, we had a bit of reassurance there. So within, I'll, co I'll come back to Experian in a minute, and, and we are looking to gather that information. So within CFMIS, um, 
we it, it, it generates um, uh, a, uh, an inspection frequency and um, that's generally done on whether they're high very high risk high risk medium low or very low and that's done using um, FSEC which is a, 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 a well a, a system that gives you um, a formula and it and it works out what sort of level of risk that um, premises is and then we'll give you a frequency on how how often you visit those premises um, and for us in Shropshire we have no very high risks and we only have 78 high risks according to CFAMIS and its formula but we know through local intelligence and experience of our inspecting officers that we've got a lot more than that so what they did um, two or three years ago was an exercise and um, to find out what we believe to be high risk so um, we know that all our sleeping risks, so care homes, um, children's homes, hospitals are high risk to us. Now, potentially, you could say high rise buildings are high risk um, because of what's happened with Grenfell. But when you look at CFAMIS prior to Grenfell or even now, um, it turns it out as a, a medium or a low risk because it's probably sprinklered. It's got no cladding on it, et cetera, et cetera. But because of intelligence that's come through, we might deem that as high risk. So to cut a long story short, what we've done is gone through all our risks and we now feel that although CFMS has told us 78 high risks, we actually believe we've got approximately 450 high risks um, in our service of that 19, yes, of that 19,000. However, then we worry about the potential 10,000 that we don't know. Um, but when we did a snapshot of what that Experian data could give us, um, funnily enough, their high risks within those extra 10,000 started to churn out um, that extra list of 450 that we, we, we brought out through our local intelligence, um, speaking to our partners and the experience of our uh, inspecting officers. So they now go in to see for miss our database, if you like, and I say manipulate, they change the frequency. So it might be for five uh, for a, a medium risk, it might be five years, but actually we'll change those 450 to a three yearly cycle because we believe them to be high risk. I just asked something else. Um, so just to touch upon the Gazetteer and the um, the contract out to Experian, are potentially those things that your local authorities know? Um, and I just wonder, I'm just curious as to why you outsource that and rather than going back to your local authorities. Um, well, ultimately, the, um, the Gazetteer, yes, um, we work in conjunction with our local authority on the Gazetteer. Um, but since I've been in, since I started working operational risk, 2013, we were talking about the Gazetteer and setting up the Gazetteer. And we're now... Um, seven years down the line and it's still not ready um, you know it, it's a hugely complex um, beast really to get to get together um, and because it's not ready um, but we as a service know that we're we're potentially sitting on only knowing two-thirds of our risks and um, so when the HMI come knocking next year um, I want to be there prepared to go well actually I'm aware of all our risks even though the high risks we're quite comfortable with those now. We've, we we know through the previous work that we've done, we know where our high risks are. But I can sit there, hand on heart. Yes, we know of all our risks. And actually, the intelligence data that we've gathered to define our high risks actually marries up to what um, a company like Experian and all their um, scientists um, can predict. We've come up with the same thing just through experience. Was it very so, expensive? Um, well, we haven't bought it as yet, um, and obviously money is very tight. Um, yeah. But that said, um, I'm not sure if you're aware, all fire services have received an uplift funding from, from yeah. central government. Um, there's, there's two pots potentially. You've got your uplift funding, and then there's the building risk review funding. So Shropshire, we basically got, I think it was 27,000 for the uplift and 60,000 for the high rise, the building risk review. Um, and because we only have five high rise buildings that are within scope, I, th I can't remember what it was now. It's something if you had under 10, you'd get 60,000 and anything under 10, 
you'd have so whether you had one or you've got 10 you still had 60,000 pounds so ultimately those two funds together we got a hundred thousand pounds to spend in the next 12 months so all of a sudden now we can go out and we can buy that Experian data without any real concern, which is great news. Um, and that is what we're looking to do now to outsource, to get that and bring it in. Okay. However, so I, I was just going to say, it does it has it has caused us a bit of a concern with our ICT department um, because what we're doing now is we want to buy off the shelf um, uh, software programs, which from an end user point of view is fantastic. But obviously from an ICT perspective, they've got to integrate that into their system and then potentially manage it. And we are getting some resistance from our ITC. They're not over, they would rather build their own systems, but because of that, it takes a long, th those things take a long time. Whereas we want to get the ball rolling, just buy it and fit it sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that, uh, hopefully that answers the question. That's no, very interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Matt, please. Sorry, get into the internet interference again. Um, well, I think you've answered all this, really. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, if you want to involve on it, there we are. How many premises do you regulate under the fire safety order of 2005? And how many of these premises are on your risk based inspection program? Well, I think you've ordered all that. I've ordered, answered all that already. Well, I think I have, but if, if yeah. you want me to go over it again, I'm more than no, happy. No, no, I'm happy. I think you've covered all that anyway. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to ask, uh, add at all, really. Uh, not really. Only other than I think, like a lot of other services, it, it's we're really mindful of the known unknowns. You know. Yeah. Uh, we are aware of a lot of the stuff that's going on. It's just those that slip under the radar uh, and it's where you get that extra information from. Um, and um, I know I heard John briefly um, before me talking about using other databases, other data sets, um, whether it's ordnance survey, etc., whether it's a gazetteer for argument's sake. Um, but as a service now, you know, our gazetteer isn't ready. So we are looking at other companies such as um, Experian and because I'm relatively new to this I've done um, a, quite a bit of research with other services and some services their risk-based inspection program might just be CFAMIS standalone that's it others might use Experian on its own and that is it um, others unlike us what we want to do now is is blend the two together um, mm. to make it as almost as a utopia, if you like, of uh, of a risk based in inspection program. Yeah, I, okay. I, we have, I think we have the same problem with mm. what we've got, you know, a, an influx of Airbnb and, you know, holiday lets, mm. which are, you know, just a massive unknown for us. So, yeah, yeah. OK, thank, thank you. Uh, thank absolutely you answer that with the, the last question. Excellent. <laughs> thank you. Thank um, you, Matt. The next one is from John, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I think you've sort of touched on mine a little bit as well, but can you define um, uh, your risk based inspection program and tell us what factors are taken into account? Do you use uh, an existing uh, model? OK, um, I've, I've written down a load of stuff here, John, and um, I, it might be worth me just sort of going through it, really, in case I missed something previously with regards to the risk based inspection program. So, so for us then, really, um, the current risk is determined through our IRMP, which I mentioned earlier, uh, and this determines the type of risk that the service has deemed um, to require the highest degree of focus uh, from its resources. Uh, these include building types, uh, which are classed as high risk. That's our, our risk-based inspection program. Uh, the definition of high risk in Shropshire is classed as premises, which are determined uh, to have a relative risk of high or very high, but like I said in Shropshire, we don't have any very high um, risks. Um, these are things such as hospitals, care homes, children's homes, uh, and any other type of risk that comes up through CFMIS as coming out as high. Um, in, this, in addition to the IRMP, um, which has identified things such as sporting venues, farming, educational centres, um, heritage and environmental risks, although there are others, primarily to us, we're looking at sleeping risks. That's that's where we tend to find most of our fatalities, if you like. Uh, 
Um, so Shropshire Fire and Rescue Service determines inspection priorities by using CFMIS, um, but a wide range of variables influence the fire risk posed by premises. Um, reference to the IRMP guidance note four. I'm not sure if you, you guys are aware of that. I did print one off for me uh, earlier, which is a document here. Um, and I'm sure Justin will be fully aware of that. Uh, and that tells us how we put together our risk based inspection program and, and see from this on how it will um, um, determine whether it's it, it, it's its level of risk. Um, so all these different premises make up our risk based inspection program, um, which structures and assists the audit process and assures uh, those premises classed as high risk are visited on a more regular basis. For us within Shropshire to meet our risk based inspection program, all our high risk premises are done as a minimum every three years, sometimes every year, um, depending on the type of risk. It may be that although CFMIS gives us certain things, we and we, we've discussed things such as sleeping risks, um, again, intelligence led. So for argument's sake, um, Grenfell came in, so there was a big purge on all high rise buildings. Um, we had uh, a number of fatalities a few years ago or a couple of fatalities in care homes. So that would focus our risk based inspection program. We would blitz all the care homes um, and then. Um, as, as, as we look going further, we will look at more um, risks as and when they come up, um, not just through CFMIS, but also which is led through intelligence locally and um, nationally. I think that's pretty much it with regards to our RBIP. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. <clears throat> Thank you, John. Uh, the next question is from me, and really it's building on that. What, what do you think should define a high risk within the risk-based inspection programme? Um, I suppose, again, going back to um, what we were saying before with regards to CFMIS, the FSEC coding, um, which, which is nationally how it, how, how it defines what high risk are. Mm -hmm. um, but again, for me, it's most of ours comes through intelligence, whether it's local, national, regional mm -hmm. intelligence. Um, and we know statistically most of our deaths are um, through sleeping risks. Yeah. So again, going back to your care homes, your hospitals, um, children's homes, etc. Yeah. Thank you very much, darling. Um, the next question is from Martin, please. Thanks, Chair. Uh, John, what are your enforcement procedures to the point of signing off an enforcement notice? Um, OK, right. Um, this is where my technical expertise starts to slip a little bit um, because obviously it's the inspecting officer that go out and, and do the enforcement. Um, Normally what happens is um, our crews will go out and if they, they know if they um, find any issues within um, an inspection and um, they would come back, the team would meet and um, because we're a relatively small team, but we're all in one office, so we're not spread across the county. Um, around the table discussions would take place to determine the best way forward. Um, and what we try to do as a service is um, rather than looking at enforcement well we will do enforcement as and when necessary and also prosecutions if you like um, but um, we try to work with businesses more rather than rather than enforce and put them out of business let's work with them and keep them in business is kind of our ethos if you like uh, as a service so we would all uh, meet around the table um, that would certainly be from the station manager and his team and um, they would discuss the right way forwards uh, with regards to the enforcement. Uh, then an enforcement notice uh, would come back. That is generally signed off by. Sorry. Uh, um, that would be signed by the chief fire officer. And um, again, because we're a small service, um, we, we're still quite happy to do that. Although you speak to the inspecting officers on the ground, they don't feel necessarily that it warrants that kind of level of um, signatory, if you like, or sign off. Um, but our chief, you know, that's what he feels he wants to happen. He feels that he's got the time and, and, the, and the, um, the position to do that. So that, that's generally what we do. That would be signed by the chief and then we would go and serve um, that 
that notice or even the inspecting officers would serve that notice. So that could be um, your watch managers, crew managers or even a green book inspecting officer. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next one is from Dominic, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, do you have any challenges with IT that are a barrier to delivering risk based inspections? Um, and if so, how do you address them, please? Um, I th I th well, we touched on this slightly before with regards to um, ICT. Um, I, I suppose, again, as the end user, there are a number of off the shelf um, software systems we could just go and buy and implement. And um, CFMIS and oh, the name escapes me at the moment. Um, I'm trying to think of the company that works with CFMIS um, on software. Um, I don't know if, if anyone can help me out, help me out. I can't think off the top of my head, but um, uh, we can basically buy the, the software systems. Um, but again, from an IT perspective, um, they would rather build their own systems. Um, but unfortunately, they have limited capacity, so it's time scales, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and also any systems that are built within our ICT comes out of their budget. Um, but like we said now, because of the uplift funding that we've had um, recently, we can use that money uh, and invest it into IT, ICT systems. So we're now looking to purchase um, the Experian data. Um, and also, I think it's now CFMIS 2, that's an, up, an upgrade on the, the software. So we will be looking to purchase that. But we do have issues with, with ICT. Um, I think because they want to build their own stuff as opposed to us wanting to go and buy off the shelf stuff. Um, regarding hardware, are you able to input stuff in the field sort of thing or? Yeah, which again goes back to the whole, the, the, the new CFMIS software is we want that upgrade because at the moment we can only input our um, um, auditing data on a desktop. So our staff have to go out, old paper copies, do their um, bit of work or put it onto their laptops, but then come back and then download it. Whereas if we can get this software upgrade, uh, which is what everybody wants, apart from ICT at the moment, unfortunately, um, is we can put it all on a tablet. You go out there, it's done on the tablets, it's downloaded live and it's there and it's in front of you. Um, but again, we're hoping because of the uplift funding now, we I'm not saying we want to bypass ICT because ultimately they are responsible for those those systems, but we can add a bit more weight now in, in, in our argument to get those systems in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, no, almost there, John. Um, Mark, I see you've joined us. Thank you, my darling. I'm sorry we're running a little bit late, but we will get to you as quickly as we possibly can. Um, the next question is from Matt, please. Right. Remember to turn me on cell phone. Right. Do you offer a primary authority scheme? And if not, what is the driver for this? Uh, do you know where I'm coming from from that one? I do. Yes, Matt. Yeah. Um, so again, in answer to the first question, no, we, do, we don't offer a primary authority scheme. Um, when I came into the department 12 months ago, it was something that we were requested um, by one of our housing authorities. And um, and we looked at it at the time and as a service, we, we were again quite uh, quite a small service uh, uh, department. Sorry, we had um, six inspecting officers, but obviously we've since grown that um, with an investment in the department. But at the time we had a small team and I fully recognize there are most definitely pros and cons to um, a primary authority scheme and providing you can make it pay for itself then absolutely it, in my head it is a way to go forwards. Um, certainly um, you're, you're going to know the businesses that are on your patch or even outside of your patch depending on, on the size of the company uh, and you can work with them to get them to be compliant etc cetera, etc. Cetera. I suppose one of the concerns at the time uh, and I was new into the department so I was still trying to get my head around it was really the conflict of interest. So the fact that we are the enforcing authority if you're now the primary authority for businesses within your own authority, if you like, um, would there be a conflict of interest um, in enforcing what you're actually trying to support? Um, so 
there was a definitely divided opinion within the within the team on whether it would work like that or you just became a primary authority for businesses outside of your own um, community area um, or uh, conversely that you're very disciplined in that those that are working in the primary authority scheme uh, within your service aren't involved in the enforcement side I, I think from my perspective, there's probably a lot more discussions to be made so that I get a better understanding of, of, of that potential conflict of interest. Um, but I think if it pays for itself, then it's got to be a good thing um, because, you know, you're supporting the businesses that are out there and that you would probably get a much better understanding of what's going on out there, if you like. Does that, does that answer your question, Mark, uh, Matt? Yeah, um, I'm just saying we've got an excellent licensing based one. We could sell you if you could. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Exactly Leave me your email. Really, really well. <laughs> it's about one of the best things we ever did. So there we go. But yeah. Ah, excellent. <laughs> Bit of a sales excellent. pitch there, Matt. That's brilliant. <laughs> there, you know, um, we, we are doing the best we can. Yeah, so. yeah. It's good to share pra good practice, isn't it? Um, there, the final question is from John, please. Um, and mine's number 14, isn't it? That's it, my love, yeah. Ah, OK, uh, can you tell us how you undertake your statutory duties and any partnership working arrangements? Um, well, our statutory duties, I can't. Did we discuss that earlier with regards to um, I, I, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm coming from the same or the correct angle um, that um, under the under the fire safety under the regulatory reform for our safety order, that gives us potentially our statutory duties and that we potentially enforce an audit under that, that order. Um, so yes, we will go out, we will audit premises, we, um, we will you know, consult on, on building regulations, planning regulations for those that come to us. We don't outwardly look for those areas, but um, yes, anyone that comes to us we consult within a set period of time um sorry what was what was the last part john of the question uh do you, just uh any work uh partnership working arrangements so partnership working um um well certainly with regards to the primary authority scheme no we haven't got anything there we haven't gone in down that route um i suppose partnership working we do work with um other authorities such as Public Health England, um, the Environmental Agency, uh, working with local authorities with safety advisory groups, and giving out um, advice there. It, it, is that the sort of kind of partnerships that you're, that you're alluding to? I'm not sure. Yes, yeah, that's to do any 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 partnership work in arrangements. So but yeah, no, that's that's fine. That's fine. Thank you. See, uh, also as well, obviously, we, we, we go out and we work with um, the police, border yeah. authority, um, housing with mates, the uh, multi-agency tactical enforcement, yeah. enforcement strategy, I think it is. Um, so yes, we do a lot of partnership working there. Yeah, good. Thank you. OK, um, thank you. Can I come to? I'm sorry, I, I've I missed out two questions, uh, John. <laughs> Lolly, you went to Fort Sense of Security. There's another couple to come, I'm afraid. Uh, oh. Dominic, next, please. So uh, hopefully these are the questions you've had advance notice of. Um, so how do the objectives of the inquiry's terms of reference affect your resp uh, respective organisation, please? OK, so uh, with regards to uh, we're looking at our current RBIP, so um, as we discussed earlier, um, it's not where we want it to be. Um, it works, but it's not as good as it could be. Um, but I think we're getting there. Um, and basically how we bring in uh, factors uh, into the risk score calculation. So um, not only does CFMIS do that for us, but also it's um, local intelligence. Local intelligence gives us so much information and, you know, and it shouldn't really be underestimated. The, the knowledge and the skill of the inspecting officers. Um, we're also exploring um, external data sources, which we talked about, Experian, um, to, Im to improve our database uh, and to make it, um, I say, foolproof, as foolproof as it can be. Yeah. Um, we've had a recent increase in the department size, so we've had an uplift. So our strategic team basically 
uh, it must be 18 months ago now, uh, we put a paper to the team off the back of Grenfell to say, look, we knew then that there was going to be extra work coming. Um, the HMI had already told us we were an under-resourced department. Um, so the service took upon itself that we invested 25% extra into our protection department, which gave us three extra inspecting officers. Um, initially, we looked at Green Book because that was a cheaper option, um, um, but gave us the inspecting officers. But um, it was felt through the strategic team that instead of two Green Book and one Grey, they actually went for two Grey Book and one green and i think that was more to do with future planning for the service you know that we're going to have an aging workforce uh, moving forwards um, and not everyone will be able to maintain operational um, competence from a physical aspect so protection might be an area for them to go so that's why we we looked at that um the um so yeah i mentioned the upcoming um all the changes in legislation um, and again, going back to the um, primary authority, again, we don't do that. Um, but um, with this included um, in the objectives, uh, we'd be interested to see the level of resourcing. And I know uh, Matt touched on it briefly and gave me a quick um, uh, sales pitch. So from a primary authority, that's something we will be looking at in the future now that we've got additional resources. No, thank you. Thanks very much for that. OK. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I've got my printer on in the background. Uh, the next one is, um, who's it coming out? Martin, next please. Um, so, um, if you could put forward three or four recommendations to the inquiry, that would support your organisation, what would they be and importantly, why? Um, OK, so uh, in general terms of improvement, uh, we've considered within our service um, or, or, and for yourselves, you could potentially look at. Um, for me, really, it's about an increase in staff. Um, I know it's an old cliche, um, but there is so much now coming into um, protection departments, as we just discussed. Um, the change in legislation that's coming now, the, the, the fire safety bill, the building safety bill, um, the fact that we're going to be involved in more areas of consultation. Um, um, I think, you know, that there's a, and, and, and also as, a, as as fire services generally um, have been cut over the years. And um, it's probably just worth noting that because of those cuts and I think Sadly, protection departments and prevention departments were the areas that were probably easier to tackle. So rather than getting rid of fire engines and firefighters off the front line, um, the the back room, if you like, departments such as prevention and protection um, and that weren't public facing, so it's probably an easier area to target. Um, that's where our cuts came and um, it's diminished to such a point now that now that we've been um, inspected again through the HMI that there's a realisation that we, we're struggling, I think, as a department. So if and where you can, um, I think that investment will pay back dividends um, in the longer term from a protection perspective. Um, so not only increasing the staff, but increasing the skills of those staff. So again, through we're going to use this through the uplift funding that's come through. So because of the change in legislation, it's ensuring that the staff fully understand those changes in legislation and they've got the skills to match those changes. And for the extra areas where we will be involved in uh, consultation, there'll be other areas of specialisms again, potentially. Um, again, for Shropshire, we're slightly different or very similar to yourselves in that our inspecting officers tend to be a jack of all trades rather than a master of one. Um, and um, whereas the larger pot potentially met brigades can have these specialist positions, but um, certainly within Shropshire, we try to train everybody up in all areas, certainly around the legal areas as well, um, getting people better trained around um, their understanding of legal um, situations and dealing with prosecutions. Uh, the um, the next one for me really would be um, talks about appropriate levels of training for staff. So I touched on it earlier with regards to extra skills, um, but also accreditation. So 
the we've got the the um, the national framework that gives us guidance on um, what levels of training individuals should be at, and um, it also talks about accreditation. So again, as a service, Shropshire, we have not got any accreditation. Uh, we never really went down that route because there was never really a need for it. Um, whereas now through the through the framework document, we do have to do that. Um, so as a service, we're potentially looking at the IFE, the Institute of Fire Engineers, as our accreditation um, process. And then lastly, uh, I've got in here legal capability. So again, Shropshire, um, we want to train up our staff, but also our legal support. Generally speaking, we use our local authority um, legal teams. Um, the only downside to that is certainly um, within Shropshire and Telford and Rekin, they perhaps don't have those specialist prosecution skills from a fire safety perspective. So we have looked at specialist solicitors uh, and lawyers out there uh, and potentially getting their skills in. Now, they can come across quite expensive, um, but one of the routes that we've taken is using them on a like a retaining fee. So we pay them um, a small amount of money to be there at our beck and call. And then should we use them, they would obviously charge us a set rate. Um, but that retaining fee, if we didn't use them for 12 months, they would then say, well, OK, rather than me giving you that money back, I would offer you X amount of training. So we would get free legal training through them. That might be, well, uh, an option for yourselves to go down that route. And they're the only three that I've managed to get together, well, Martin. Thank you very much. They're all very useful. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Dominic, you wanted to come back with a question. Yeah, just very quickly, you touched on training. Um, so it's been suggested to us by other witnesses that perhaps um, all operational staff should be at a level three for fire safety. Um, it would, it, would that something you would endorse or do you think that's? I, um, I would absolutely endorse it. I think the, um, the reality um, is much more difficult um, to, to, to achieve. Um, so level three is a, as an advisory capacity. And I think, again, speaking to a lot of services and where we're looking to go at the moment within our own service is we recognise now that our operational crews aren't doing any protection work. Um, once we started to realise, uh, once the framework document came out, um, they weren't trained to a set specific level um, when we start talking about short audits. Uh, and a lot of it was around terminology. Um, although they might go out and give a bit of advice, um, they shouldn't be carrying out an audit per se. Um, so we stopped, um, but obviously we've really looked at it and, and it was a recommendation from the HMI to us as well to, to encourage our operational crews to do more fire safety work. So initially in the shorter term, what we're looking to do in is we are going to put together a training package for all our operational, well, all our whole time operational crews, not our on call. Um, potentially a training package that might only be half a day to a day to give them some fire business fire safety awareness so that they would go out and they would have a template to follow that would ask certain questions. So really it's more of a information gathering exercise. And then like we've talked about before, if that could be done on tablets, it's all downloaded automatically back into the protection department where the inspecting officers that are level four and level five pick up this information and they'll determine whether actually a full audit is required or not. But then in the longer term, what we want to do is get at least one person per watch trained to a minimum level three. In, in a utopia, it'd be nice to have them as level four as a, as a full blown inspecting officer for complex buildings. But the problem is not so much the initial training, it's the maintenance of competence and then keeping their CPD. There are ways around that and potentially rotating them around in the within the department. Um, but quite um, an ambitious um, and potentially logistic nightmare in getting everyone up to level three or four. Um, but I think for us short term is give them some localized training to gather information for us. Uh, longer term, we'll be trained up one person per watch, two if we're lucky, to level minimum level three, which fits in with the uh, framework, the advisory framework. Yeah, thank you for that. Okay. Okay. Thank um, you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's that's been fascinating.
for, for your time. It's been really interesting. A um, little bit of homework if you can do for us. Do you need Joe to just send you an email to let you know what it is that we're wanting from you or have you made a note about the, the structure earlier on? Um, no, no, I haven't. Uh, I wouldn't. I, I'm not. I, I, I'm, I'm only male. I can't multitask. Oh, I, can only do, I can only talk to you and, and do one thing at a time. So okay. um, I'll, but what I'll I have done yeah. Yeah, sorry. Is, is, is the notes that I've got. I will yeah. I will email those on to Justin if that if that's OK. That's lovely, that's lovely. Um, and you. then if Joe's got any or any questions that you'd like to ask any further yeah. questions, please email me and then you, I'll darling. respond back to those. Right. Thank you, my love. We appreciate your time, sweetheart. It's very good to see you. Um, sorry okay. we got overrun this afternoon. Um, uh, as I said before, with the with the other gentleman, if you if you'd like to stay with us, you're very welcome to. Um, or if not, I know how busy you are. If you need to go, that's also okay. But can I thank you very much for your time and the information this afternoon, please? Oh uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I hope some of my information was useful to you. It's very, very. Um, thank you. I, I, I will have to leave you because I've got another meeting to go to, okay, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so. Take care of yourselves and you take care now. All the very yeah, thank best. You. Bye. 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 Thank bye. You. Um, thank you. Colleagues, uh, do you want a five minute break or do you want to carry on? A five minute break. OK, five minutes um, can, can please, I yeah. can, as as Joe has said in the past, because the recording stays running, can you turn your microphones and your video cameras off then, please, while we have a five minute break? Um, yeah. OK, Joe, can I have a chat to you if you're there? on whatsapp yeah okay on whatsapp okay or shall i phone you yes okay darling all right yes if you can okay i'll do that
Hi, Justin. Hello, Madam Chair. How are you doing? All right, my darling. Thank you. Um, right, I think we're ready to start again. Um, hope everybody's there. Uh, Mark, uh, welcome to you, my love. It's very nice of you to be here with us this afternoon and uh, um, looking forward to hearing what you've got to say to us. So it'll be really good. So uh, welcome. And I'm sorry we're a little bit late uh, getting to you, but um, if we can start off with the questions, we've got several questions for you. And the first one is Dominic, please. Uh, thanks very much, Chair, and good afternoon, Mark. Um, so, first question, can you tell us about the role of the National Fire Chiefs Council, please? Yeah, sure. Hi, Dominic, and hi, Carolyn, and, and thanks very much for the invite. More than happy to be here following up from the uh, the, uh, the uh, peer review I did with uh, Cornwall colleagues um, 18 months or so ago now. So, the, the National Fire Chiefs Council is the uh, professional voice of the UK Fire and Rescue Service, um, established in its current form uh, just coming up four years ago now. Um, and existed previously as the Chief Fire Officers Association. Um, the chair of the National Fire Chiefs Council is currently Roy Wilshire, who was a previous Chief Fire Officer, acts as the advisor to government, um, so sort of directly into the Fire Minister and to the Home Secretary. And then sitting underneath Roy, alongside the sort of structure of the central team of the National Fire Chiefs Council, are a number of committees that link out into fire and rescue services, of which uh, my protection committee is one of those. Um, at its heart, the NFCC is a membership body um, and it's comprised of about four or five hundred members, which is both Green Book and Green Book members of staff who are senior management services across the UK. And its, its job really is about support, guidance, uh, consistency, collaboration, uh, and also representing the voice of fire and rescue services um, across the UK into government and their respective um, devolved assemblies. And in a lot of sort of stakeholder management in that, whether that's Home Office, MHCLG, say devolved governments, local government association and employers, uh, and then obviously um, recently Her Majesty's Inspectorate um, as well. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a flavour, Dominic. You know, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. It's interesting. Um, Matt, next, please. Um, afternoon, Mark. Um, can you tell us about your role as chairman of the Protection and Business Safety Committee, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I could probably, probably spend about two hours doing this, Matt, but I'll, I shall confine it to just a couple of minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, can, you know, shorter yeah, slightly. I'll be, be brief. <laughs> um, so I've been the chair now since the start of the NFCC um, in April 2017, I think it was. Um, so the committee itself is a pretty broad church um, in terms of what it's involved in, but primarily it's about the um, the role of the or supports the fire services in their role um, as in the regulation of the built environment through the regulatory reform fire safety order. Um, and it's about um, my, my role really is about coordinating the, the efforts of all the fire and rescue services across the country. Um, and providing guidance and support to enable them to deliver that function in the best possible way. And uh, we do that through working very closely with stakeholders, some of those who I meant, uh, mentioned in the response to Dominic's question. Um, mm -hmm. We also lobby and advise government on behalf of fire and rescue services as well. So post Grenfell, there's been an awful lot of work oh. in the world of protection around the government's building safety programme and my committee gather the views of fire and rescue services. Whilst we're gathering them, we're informing their views as well because we're sat at the heart of government where all of this is taking place. And then having sort of thrown that around the melting point, we then lobby and play back a broad NFCC view back into government to help shape uh, future legislation, future guidance um, and things like that. So I have now, because NFCC is now better funded than it used to be, um, I have a central team um, within the protection function who do a lot of that work, who are comprised of um, a number of secondments from fire services across the country. And they're working on things like government consultations, development of new guidance, uh, the recommendations from the Grenfell Tower inquiry related to protection, uh, competence um, of inspecting officers, which I know uh, John was talking about in the previous session. Um, we put in a protection perspective into the Fire Services Comprehensive Spending Review, um, submissions into Treasury. And then outside of the sort of core protection role, I'm also involved in 
um, coordinating nationally the fire services response to automatic fire alarm signals and the work we do around fire investigation. So a pretty broad church, Matt. Okay. Uh, okay. Can I have a second question? Yes, darling. Yes. Just a quick one. Um, so if we were to lobby you uh, about like a register for Airbnb and uh, tourist catering facilities, um, you're the pe people we lobby then? Yeah, so your your protection colleagues, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a topical subject, mm. um, Airbnb, so lobbying the protect, your protection colleagues, and Justin in particular was involved in this work, uh, were involved in the lobbying into government and into the NFCC about upgrading the previous do you have paying guest guides um, to make it more reflective of the um, the sort of economy, tourist economy that exists now around Airbnbs and other similar sites versus the more traditional bed and breakfast type environment. So, so yeah, that is the lobbying international government often comes in through the NFCC, through colleagues like uh, Justin and others in your protection teams. Lovely. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you. Um, next question is from John, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mark. Um, do you have a view about different governance arrangements for fire authorities? Here's, here's a good question, John. Um, so I think, I, I suppose, the, the politically correct answer as a chief fire officer is, is no, I don't have a view. Um, but, but outside of that, I'll, uh, I'll share some experiences, if you like. Um, so my reflection is I don't necessarily think one governance arrangement is any better than another. Um, and my background is Suffolk Fire and Rescue Service as deputy and then chief fire officer. Um, so a county council service. And then prior to that in Essex as a combined fire authority. So I've served in both. Um, I think for me, um, governance is important, but actually it's the relationships that exist within that governance arrangement um, and not just personal relationships, but much more importantly, the professional relationship and the clarity of the roles between um, officers and elected members and how that is set out in things like constitutions, schemes of delegations um, and things like that. So when I look at my own environment in Suffolk, where I, I think um, I operate in a county council governance arrangement with a cabinet and a council and I operate to a cabinet member. The critical relationships to me which determine the success or not of that governance arrangement are between me, the chief executive, the 151 officer, the leader of the council and the cabinet member is the sort of axis of critical relationships for me. Um, what I would say about county council governance arrangements um, but it's much more, it's also the structure that sits under the governance is it does naturally lend itself towards a very partnership type approach across all of the different functions uh, within the council. And I know it's obviously slightly different circumstances in Cornwall with the single unitary, but that close working relationships between the individual um, teams and functions within the county environment, um, I think are very helpful. Oh, great, okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Next one is from me, please, Mark, if I may. Um, how important do you think the role of scrutiny is to hold the fire authority to account? Yeah, I, I think it, it's a critical part of the, the functioning of, of local democracy, Carolyn. And, and when it's done well, I think it's a really, really effective tool. Um, I think it, it brings um, assurance um, around that, that governance of individual functions within different authorities. So almost that part of that layered approach to your sort of code of corporate governance and things like that. So I think it has a really critically important part in the role of fire authorities. Um, and within that, I think what it tends to do is to bring a different and fresh perspective um, to um, what's previously been um, received or, or general awareness of both members and officers. Um, into the governance of that organisation and also allows um, when it's done in, in the way that you're doing it now, to be, to be honest, it allows and supports that really deep dive down into a particular mm -hmm. subject, which yeah. doesn't tend to happen through the sort of natural authority arrangements, which are more about the kind of ticking along of um, business as usual, if you like. So I think when it's done well, Carolyn, it's a really effective tool and a really important tool as the governance of our authorities. Thank you. You get brownie points for that one. That's good. <laughs> I'll get a warm self a biscuit. <laughs> uh, the next question is from Martin, please. Thank you, Chef. Good afternoon, Mark. Hi. Um, 
what are your views on the balance of grey and green book staff in relation to fire safety activities? Yeah, yeah another good question and a much discussed one over about the last 10 years, I think. Um, I think um, I think a, a balance across the two um, is a really effective way to set up protection teams, because um, I think um, if nothing else, it brings you different perspectives um, and different viewpoints into the single protection team that you're setting up but in addition to that i think it also goes a bit beyond that as well uh, when you have that blended approach because if you look at um, grey book staff then clearly they tend to bring an operational fire service background uh, which is really helpful when they're looking if you like beyond what the guidance says into the practical application of fire safety in a building with some knowledge about what happens when that building catches fire um, I also think they bring with them a knowledge of the broader fire and rescue service, which is really important when protection shouldn't be something that's seen in isolation. It's actually an intrinsic part of the operational side of the fire and rescue service and the prevention side of the service as well. Um, and by having grey book staff coming through the protection functions, it also creates middle and senior managers in five and 10 years time who have a really good understanding of the protection function within a fire and rescue service, which is increasingly important. The flip side of that, of course, is Green Book staff um, who tend to come into the organisation fresh from a different background. So bring that different perspective. They often bring a degree of technical knowledge around building safety because they might come in from private sector or local authority building safety or they might come straight out of university or college or wherever um, and they've got um, other experiences and other knowledge as well just having worked in in different sectors. On the flip side I would say one of the difficulties with grey book staff is that you tend to turn them over pretty quickly in protection teams um, because there is the opportunity by and large for them to move sideways into other roles if they decide protection isn't for them and they want to take their career in a different direction or they're really good and they tend to get promoted quite quickly, often outside of the protection function. So you can invest quite a lot of time and energy and money um, training them up to be really good protection officers. And just at the point they get effective, they leave and go to another part of the fire service. Um, services tended to move towards Green Book staff seven, eight, nine years ago, I guess, because it would give um, a bit more security and stability to protection teams. Um, and I think that was right for a period of time, but we're starting to see that change now um, because there is such a market for really good qualified um, protection staff uh, outside of the fire and rescue service. So fire services are finding themselves a bit of a victim of taking people on green book terms and conditions, training them up to a really good standard, giving them a really good grounding in the world of protection in the fire and rescue service. And then they disappear off into the private sector to go and earn 30 percent more. Um, and I get that and I understand it, but it does cause us some difficulties in the fire service, particularly if you've invested, I don't know, five years of training them up to be a fire engineer um, and then you lose them to another organisation. So I think on balance, Martin, it's a really interesting subject area. Um, and in my service, um, then I'm tending to go for a blended approach between the two. Thanks. Um, and yeah, the point that you've made about uh, the uh, the appeal of uh, private sector salaries has, has been made by several of our witnesses. Yeah, absolutely. But, but also the challenge of 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 grey book staff invariably still wearing an operational hat um, and and that often drawing them away from their protection duties um, to, to to go and do the core job of fighting fires. Yeah, absolutely, and we do see that in terms of uh, they tend to get pulled from left, right, and centre. Um, and yeah, that is one of the other limitations. Thanks. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Dominic, please. Thanks, Chair. So what are your views regarding the re-employment of retiring fire safety officers, particularly in respect of the time taken to train and qualify within the new competence framework? And how could this be addressed, please? Yeah, it's uh, again, it's a pretty topical subject area, uh, Dominic. So um, on, on the face of it, um, I think being able to um, hold on to really good protection officers um, beyond the point at which they can retire, why as a fire and rescue service would you not want to do that? Because when you cut it right down to the kind of core thrust of it, 
um, really well trained, professional, experienced protection officers are leaving the fire and rescue service because financially there's no incentive for them to stay because of the way that the pension arrangements work and things like that. So I think um, um, there, there, there needs to be a, a mechanism that is clearer and better now than it is now to enable services to hold on to those members of staff or bring those members of staff uh, back where it's the right thing to do. Um, I mean, I, I, too many too many stories um, from fire and rescue services who are who are losing people who actually don't really want to go, but feel they don't have a great deal of choice. So um, it's a tricky one. And some services are abating people's pensions and bringing them back um, and making an individual case to do that. And I think that's really down to individual authorities to make that decision on its merits. OK, thank you very much. OK, uh, the next question is from Matt, please. All right, turn myself on again. OK. In your opinion, what should drive protection activities and why? Now, there's a broad question for you. Yeah, it is. Um, OK, so I think what should drive it um, is risk. Um, and when, when I say risk, then I think um, what, what I mean is um, we, we should we should develop a picture of what risk looks like in an authority area from a protection perspective based upon the data and the information that is available to us. And you have your data systems in Cornwall's like I have mine elsewhere, and there'll be some pros and cons associated with those systems. And then overlaid with that is a degree of professional judgment that comes into that. So I'm a strong believer that professional judgment has value, um, but it has value alongside being informed by data and evidence um, as well. And in terms of risk, um, I think there are a number of facets to what risk actually means um, but if I just pick off some so part of it is about what the building is used for um, mm. and I, I know um, John earlier was talking about sleeping risk as an example which which quite rightly elevates um, the risk of a building up when there is a sleeping risk there uh, I think beyond sleeping risk what's the use of that building so what type of sleeping risk is it so is it a care home that at night um, has a number of very vulnerable people and one or maybe two members of staff available or is it a hospital which is a 24 7 rolling facility with very good protection systems um, and uh, good management control in there and the level of risk is different um, in both of those increasingly we're starting to look at modern methods of construction uh, which should inform our thinking as well so um, cladding on the side of Grenfell Tower is a modern method of construction um, and we're being much more aware now of uh, different methods of construction that are coming um, online from the construction industry um, to enable them to build the number of houses in the sorts of volumes that are expected over time. And from a service perspective, our interest in is yes, we support modern methods of construction, but it needs to be sustainable and we need to understand and be assured that they're tested in terms of how will they react when the building catches fire. So modern methods of construction informs that risk picture as well. We then get into vulnerability and the type of people. Um, so the building and the use of the building and then how vulnerable are the people in the building and vulnerability often links to um, how likely are they to be involved in a fire scenario? And if they are involved in a fire scenario, how able are they to evacuate themselves or be evacuated by others uh, out of that particular environment? And all of that plays into vulnerability. And then there's a couple of other um, factors I would play in. So there's a, there's a risk is informed by the sort of management control arrangements that exist in a So this is where we start to look to work with other, other organisations like CQC. So if you've got a, a property that's inspected by the CQC, if it's inspected poorly by the CQC from a health perspective, you can almost bet that the management control about fire safety isn't going to be great either. So we mm. can use that to inform how we do it. And then the last one, and this has come out loud and clear on the back of Grenfell is there is um, consideration about the voice of residents um, as well. So what are the people living in this environment think about the fire safety in the environment in which they're working and how do we factor that into how we determine um, what, are, what are the premises that are higher risk? Yeah, OK, thank you. Lovely. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Darren. Uh, the next question is from John, please. Yes, thank you. Um, we are informed that the national average for audits 
has dropped from 5% of known risk to 3% over the past five years. Do you have an opinion on why this might be? Yeah, I, I um, so I, I think the I think there's a there's a pretty strong and clear link for it to me. It's it's that fire services in general have a lot less protection staff than they used to have, um, and and again John touched on it earlier. And I think as we've gone through um, a period of austerity since sort of 2008 2009, um, services have generally shrunk across the piece, and I think protection teams have generally shrunk. Um, um, more significantly within that service environment. So there's a direct correlation between the number of audits and inspections that, that are carried out against the number of inspecting officers that you have within your service. So I think that's one element. The second element for me would be that um, the, the rate of the turnover of staff within those protection teams feels like it's getting quicker, um, not slower. Um, and um, when, when you take a new member of staff into your protection team, if they come in with no qualifications or experience at all, then you're probably looking at least 12 to 18 months before they become an individual who can start to go out with confidence and carry out some of these audits and inspections. And I know just from a, a period of time, about two or three years ago in my own service, uh, half of my protection team of 12 or 11, 12 officers um, had done less than a year. So effectively, I had, a, I had a team that was running at 50 percent of capacity for 12 to 18 months. And I think that's indicative of what we're seeing um, in, in other service areas as well. Um, and then I suppose the, the last bit, I think we're starting to see that being addressed with the additional funding coming out of government, which has given some uplift funding into every fire and rescue services. And I think Post Grenfell has absolutely shone a light yeah. on the challenges around building safety across the UK. Um, and that has caused chief fire officers and senior teams and fire authorities um, to think again about um, the extent to which they focus and um, resource their protection functions. Yeah. Super. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next one is from me, please, Mark. Can you tell us about national risk based inspection program models and what your views are on them, please? OK, um, so. Um, so. so I mean, the risk based inspection process has been around for as long as I can remember, really, certainly going back to um, the sort of genesis of RMPs in the early 2000s. And there was guidance that was put out. There was national guidance um, and then services developed their risk based inspection programs based upon FSEC models that John was talking about earlier. And we sort of get down right into the weeds and the detail of that. I think what's happened since then is that inevitably services have become uh, more innovative, more creative, and use much more local information and evidence and data and judgment to set up their risk-based inspection program, broadly based on the previous national guidance that existed, but also overlaid with a great deal of local intelligence. Um, so, which is, which is why you, you've ended up with um, sort of different different approaches in different parts of the country. But I still think fire services broadly in a position where they are putting similar premises into their risk-based inspection program. Um, I think the, the inspectorate has come in um, and because the inspectorate is very keen to be able to compare apples with apples, um, has found it extremely difficult in a fire and rescue service that is governed in 40 odd different ways across mm -hmm. England um, and in the environment of localism over the last however many years, which has lent, meant services going in slightly different directions. So there, there is some work going on nationally to effectively put in place um, a, a model around um, how you determine risk within your integrated risk management plan and how that informs the risk based inspection program that you set up alongside that. And there'll be a fire standard linked to that piece of work that comes out that services will expect to be able to apply and benchmark their work against and it will give authorities the opportunity to sort of test their RMP against a national standard. My view is it will still give services some leeway and flexibility to, to base your risk based inspection program on that national standard, but still have the flexibility to apply the local circumstances yeah. that are relevant to you, which I actually mm -hmm. think are really important because yeah. 
Cornwall is very different to London, is very different to Northumberland. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. That's reassuring. Um, Dominic wanted to ask a question. So, yeah, just by, um, building on that, um, within our evidence pack, we've got a thing called the Northwest model, which I'm sure you're aware of. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, are you, are you saying that that perhaps you know that's fine for people in the northwest, um, and um, really we ought to just be sticking to um, waiting for the national guidance to firm up and sticking to our own way of doing things? Yeah. So, so the, the um, I mean, I was involved in in the, the work around the northwest stuff. So if, if I go if I go back about a year, eighteen months ago, um, across the UK fire service, there was a a desire to create a consistent methodology for risk based inspection programs. Um, and the Northwest had done some work within their region to develop a system that worked for them on a regional approach. Um, although I still understand that one service in the region hasn't adopted that approach, but the others have. Um, and when we, we brought a group of people together, a um, hundred or so people, I think Justin would have been there, um, to discuss this up in Merseyside. Um, and the agreement was that, yes, we could do with the consistency um, and we, we we'd sign up to doing this piece of work. The challenge is it's a significant piece of work to do it properly nationally. And at the time, we just weren't resourced centrally within NFCC to be able to do that. So we are now better resourced and we are now doing a piece of work um, through a program called the Community Risk Program and a project within that called the Definition of Risk, which will inform risk based inspection programs. And that will be drawing from things like the Northwest model um, and other approaches out there. So. I suppose what um, in, in Suffolk, um, then we're aware of the Northwest model. Uh, we're aware of the approach that we currently take and we're aware of the emerging work in the community risk programme. And this year and next year, it's really about making sure that within that context, we're happy that we've got a risk based inspection programme that stands up to scrutiny. Um, so I think at the moment it's something you can benchmark your performance against as opposed to necessarily throwing your all your eggs in that basket. Um, just at this point in time. That's useful, thank you. That's, yeah, very helpful, thank you. Um, the next question is from Martin, please. Thanks, Chair, and, and Mark, I, I think you've, you, you have covered a lot of this already um, uh, in, in some of your earlier answers, but what do you think should define high risk within a risk-based inspection programme? Yeah. You, you sound like someone from the HMI, Martin. It's exactly the sort of question I get asked when they come and see me there. <laughs> Um, so I, 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 yeah, I think I probably picked it up earlier. So I think it's it's sleeping risk. It's the it's the uh, when you look at a building, the factors that consider that building to be high risk. So the occupancy of the building and the vulnerability of those occupants, whether that's from a um, whether it's from a um, a care perspective, um, or there's a whole range of other reasons why people are considered to be vulnerable, whether it's around uh, mobility, whether it's around drug and alcohol dependency and all sorts of things like that. Um, modern methods of construction I would include. Uh, I would also include things like heritage. Um, so there's a significant risk around the sort of national heritage sector. Uh, the management control I touched on earlier, the ability of people to evacuate themselves out of a building with or without um, assistance. And then the one I probably didn't touch on earlier was also um, so fire data information. So are you getting trends of patterns of fire uh, either locally within Cornwall or nationally, which might lend you towards that? And a good example of that, um, a good, a small example, but a good example of that recently, I think, was panic rooms. So all of a sudden, panic rooms became the leisure thing to do. Um, and that threw itself up and it raised itself uh, with fire because I think it was five people died in a panic room fire in Poland. Um, so all of a sudden fire services across the country saying, well, I think we've got some of those on our patch. We need to go and have a look at the fire safety arrangements within them. So you get emerging issues like that come up as well, Martin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now back to Dominic again, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, what are your views on the primary authority scheme and its value to fire and rescue services? OK. I remember this from 18 months ago when I came down and, and, and saw what you've got down in Cornwall and you've got a really impressive arrangement around primary authority schemes and, and the conversations I was having very much built into your support about or approach around support in the local economy. So um, as, a, as a general um, tenor, my view is they're a good thing, um, the primary authority schemes, um, because they, they give a degree of uh, consistency 
um, they can support, um, um, particularly when you, when you set them up on a local level, they can support the local economy and all of the benefits that brings in round uh, to local authorities as well. Um, and um, they also um, clearly support a degree of consistency for fire and rescue services across the country. So we're not finding ourselves in a position where two neighbouring fire and rescue services are taking a completely different approach around fire safety with a single premises. So I think the principle of it um, is sound. I think the when it's applied in local services, um, I think it's important that the service considers the sort of cost benefit analysis around it. And there's a clear business case around taking on the primary authority schemes in a way that you have confidence as a service and as an authority that it adds value without impacting significantly in a detrimental way on your broader risk-based inspection program, because it might be that your primary authority partner it is a set of premises that are nothing to do with your risk-based inspection program because they're not particularly considered to be high risk. Um, so I think if, if your business case stacks up and you're not drawing resource or significant resource away from your primary work, then I think there's, there's real value in it. And actually it can enable you to put additional resource uh, into those areas of high risk if you set it up in an appropriate way. Um, and then I think that the last bit I would add in there is that I think it's important that you build into that um, an evaluation process about the effectiveness of that primary authority scheme and that informs your ongoing development of it. Um, so I think in general terms, Martin, I'm, I'm broadly supportive of it. Um, and I think you've got a system down there which many fire and rescue services would look at with a degree of envy. Thank you. Good, thank you very much for that. Uh, the next question is from Matt, please. Okay, Kenki, um, what are the opportunities and benefit of a fire authorities working closely with partners? Are you aware of any good examples that you wish to share? I think you've just done that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, um, so partnerships for authorities. Partners. Okay, well, I think primary authority schemes is a really good example where you've got that sort of partnership within the local economy. So I won't um, dwell on that one again. No. Um, I think the, the partnership between fire services and local authority building control um, is really, really important. I mean, we're seeing, uh, I mean, I'm listening on a regular basis, as you would expect to the podcast on the Grenfell Tower public inquiry. Um, and you hear of the difficulties in terms of um, the building environment and the role of local authority building control in that. So I think the partnership relationship between fire services and local authority building control, but also approved inspector bodies as well, doing similar work to LABC. Um, then um, and some of the some of the other ones I'm just going to touch on are also partnerships through the NFCC. So Justin will be involved in some of these as as, um, as a sort of key member in the NFCC work. So things like the CQC. So having that relationship with them is really important because it informs the work that we do. Uh, we've got a, an MOU with the CQC from NFCC. We also have an MOU with the NHS Estates function um, okay. because the, the kind of hospital built environment is important and there are some uh, across the country there are some challenges around the built environment in hospitals particularly um, those on PFI contracts and things like that um, and then the other two groups I suppose I would pick out would be um, your local chamber, chamber of commerce and business groups um, so it enables fire and rescue services to get a fire safety message through those business bodies out into small and medium enterprises uh, because you, you have a limited resource in your protection function in the same way that every other fire and rescue service does, which you want to target towards the highest risk groups. But actually, you don't want to ignore those that are ticking along underneath. So what can you provide into those businesses to enable them to be broadly aware of what they need to do to satisfy their own fire safety responsibilities in a way that it doesn't mean the fire and rescue service have to engage with them or audit them on a regular basis? Um, and then the last one I would pick out, um, and this is informed by some evidence and research that was carried out by the NFCC, is some partnerships with groups um, that represent business in particular within black and minority ethnic groups. Um, because the, the research and evidence that was carried out was that um, the, those groups tend to be less aware of the regulatory fire safety environment. Um, from a, from a being informed perspective, but also on a preparedness to step into and engage in that enforcement environment as well. So and I think sometimes um, there is a partnership role that the Fire and Rescue Service can take on 
uh, to break down and work through some of those barriers in a way that helps those businesses to set themselves up in a way that supports their own fire safety of them and their staff and their businesses. OK, thank you. OK, thank you, Mark. Um, last question you'll be glad to hear is okay. actually from John. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, how do the objectives in the in inquiries team's terms of reference reflect the recommendations from the 2019 local government a social um, association and national fire chiefs council uh, thematic protection peer challenge that you lead on god that's a mouthful <laughs> yeah no, it was yeah um, I, I suspect that this one might be coming about the recommendations we made 18 months ago so i was just refreshing on myself on them this morning and um, to be honest, i think the approach you're taking um is really sound um because the the first recommendation in the peer review we did was about member oversight member engagement and member awareness um of the world of protection and how you determine and set up your risk-based inspection program so as an authority you can draw a degree of confidence and assurance um, that you are meeting the requirements of the national framework document which are very clear about rmps and having a, a clear robust risk-based inspection program so i think that the approach you're going through here with the scrutiny committee um, full square enables you to do that um, in terms of the evidence you're gathering and the breadth of people you're speaking to and the questions that you're asking um, and equally I'm just picking out a couple of the other recommendations I mean uh, we referred to that uh, green book grey book dynamic um, in the peer review particularly around the development of green book staff and, and how they see a career path uh, through there and we, we talked about some of that um, and also we reflected on the uh, primary authority scheme uh, you've got in place there and I, and I know you've been looking at evidence and questioning around that so I think the work you're doing now sits really in squarely and nicely with uh, the recommendations from the report. Oh, thank Good. you very much. Thank you. Um, that's the end of our questions, Mark. So can I thank you very much? I know you're pushed for time because you've got to get off to another meeting, but uh, yeah. I, think, I think we've managed it in time for you. Um, yeah. It's been lovely to meet you this afternoon and thank you very much for your input and for your assistance. No, you're all the welcome. Best. Thank you all very the, much. Nice to meet all you the very all. best, my love. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Um, Joe, that's the end of the um, session, the formal session. So um, would, can you stop the recording, please? Yes. When it's convenient with you.